members of the public and I'd acknowledge we have Dr Carmen Lawrence here in our midst tonight. Welcome to our chamber. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Um, we will go through uh, our agenda. Um, it, I'll just acknowledge the Wajuk people as the traditional owners of the Greater Fremantle Wallyalup area and we recognise that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still important today. Um, attendance, apologies and leaves of absence, is there any? No? Disclosures of interest by members? Councillor Camberton? No. Um, yes, I disclose that I'm a Kiwi and a Pup Dog. Yes. Great. <laughs> um, responses to previous uh, questions? Oh, oh, sorry, no. Councillor Marta? Um, yes, I've uh, disclosed an interest in F Hole 221005, um, and uh, having um, there being a fisherman in Shingo Harbour, and so I'll leave the chamber for that particular item. Thank you. Thank you. No others. No responses to previous questions taken on notice. There are none. Public question time. Um, because we have. Um, people here to speak on several items and one of which is the, the bridge proposal. Um, I'm suggesting that we deal with the item to do with um, the notice of motion which is item eight I think, is that right? Seven, seven eight, yes. Um, and th if because there are not very many speakers and then we will just deal with that item and then those people will be able to um, go home if they wish to, but they're very welcome to stay for the rest of the debate. But that way, what we will then go on into the um, others which have a lot more people here to speak. Um, so could I invite people um, to speak on the notice of motion which was put up by Councillor Lang. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just pulling it up. Um, so I have on the list uh, Stephanie Polly, is it? She said, I couldn't quite read the writing. Yeah. Would you like to come and speak? It's um, public question time, uh, public comment slash question time is three minutes and you're invited to come forward, speak at the microphone because we record the session. Thank you. Thank you for being patient while I hobble over. I broke my foot and my doctor would be very happy to know that I'm here, but I hope this shows how passionate about I am about this motion. So, dear Mayor and Councillors, thank you for taking the time tonight to consider this motion on banning fossil fuel advertisements in this city that I call home. I'm Steffi, and I've been living in Fremantle for about six years now, and I'm sure you can relate when I say, damn, I love Frio. To be more specific, I love our close proximity to the ocean, and being able to ride my bike in the early morning down to South Beach for a sneaky dip before work, and then um, hurrying back there to catch the magnificent sunsets. We need to record it, that's the oh, reason. Sorry. I'm here tonight on behalf of many other locals and residents who feel the same. In particular, I'm supporting this motion on behalf of the Fremantle Environmental Collective, a group of passionate individuals that are really um, passionate about ensuring the city remains as beautiful as it is for generations to come. The year I moved here, was 2016, which was also the year the Fremantle Council released the South Fremantle Coast Coastal Adaptation Plan, which quotes, the coast will become increasingly vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise and storm surges, both of which are a direct result of climate change 
We're just trying to fix the uh, echo. Sorry about that. Should I continue? We'll just, yeah, just, we'll just try and resolve the problem because it must be frustrating trying to speak. I'll go back. Um, no? Hello? Good? Awesome. Yeah, actually, that does sound better. So the year I moved here was 2016, and it was also the year the Fremantle Council released the South Fremantle Coast Coastal Adaptation, Adaptation Plan, which quoted, the coast will become increasingly vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise and storm surges, both of which are a direct result of climate change accelerated by the unsustainable consumption of fossil fuels. I'm not here to state or recite facts that we all already know about our changing climate. I'm going to leave that to the experts that would speak later on and the scientists. It's been six years since the report was released. And even though I'm grateful our council is taking action to adapt to these impacts, I'm wondering, is anything being done to address the root cause of these issues, to slow down their frequency, so that effective adaptation can actually take place. Now, I know reducing the production of fossil fuels might be out of the hands of a local council, but what arguably is in the hands of the council is your ability to lead the way in reducing consumption and doing what lies in your power to protect the health and well-being of all the people in this community that you represent. The elderly that suffer during the extended and scorching summers, the most vulnerable that cannot afford to cool themselves down, and the constituents who own businesses that will soon get washed away. And of course, your children's children that might never get to experience Fremantle's natural assets in all their glory, just like you and I do right now. On behalf of this amazing and diverse community who have the right to live in a healthy and thriving environment, I urge you all to support the motion to ban fossil fuel advertising so that the dramatic climate changes um, are tackled from the root cause as opposed to us scrambling to adapt. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, the next I've just mentioned these people, but if they, they were, I think they said they wanted to be observers. Brett Montgomery, observer. Yeah, could you please? Yeah, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Brett Montgomery. I live in the city of Fremantle, and I'm also a medical practitioner. And I'm here today speaking on behalf of the organisation called Doctors for the Environment of Australia. I, I ask that the, council, the committee members um, <coughs> support the motion put by Councillor Lang that the city investigates the restriction of fossil fuel advertising and sponsorship by fossil fuel companies. As a representative of a doctor's organisation, I'll speak today from a health angle. Often climate change is spoken about as an uh, environmental issue separate from human health, an issue of polar bears and melting ice, but it's also a health issue of great importance. And when health professionals worry about climate change, we worry about health impacts. We worry about direct effects of high temperatures, like heat stroke. We worry about the health effects of extreme weather disasters, like people killed or displaced in floods or fires. We worry about a host of health effects that are less direct, but no less real. About heart and lung disease, by air pollution. Pollution that even now kills hundreds of Australians each year. We worry about allergies caused by lengthening pollen, pollen seasons. About waterborne infections fostered by warmer waters about disease carrying mosquitoes, expanding their territories, about malnutrition caused by crop failures, about the social and mental health impacts of all of these physical effects, and about the despair that the threat of climate change causes for so many people. We worry that it's the poorest and most vulnerable people who will suffer these effects most severely. 
And we worry that we are seeing these impacts unfolding already, knowing that with business as usual, we may see much worse warming by the end of the century. It's for these reasons and more that the World Health Organization says that climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Indeed, the World Health Organization predicts that annual worldwide deaths attributable to climate change will soon reach a quarter of a million. I thank the Fremantle Council for having adopted last year a climate emergency position statement. One thing that health professionals learn quickly in their training is that health emergencies require immediate action. Likewise, so does a climate emergency. We must make rapid and deep cuts to emissions. But companies that profit from fossil fuels want us to delay. And they seek delay through greenwashing with advertising and by buying social license with sponsorship. As a society, there are many things we must do to decarbonise our energy systems and mitigate as best we can the future impacts of fossil fuel pollution. And one tangible thing that this committee can do today is support this motion to restrict fossil fuel company advertising and sponsorship. There are many precedents for the restriction of advertising of unhealthy things. Think, for example, of tobacco or guns. We need to denormalise fossil fuels and diminish the social licence of their manufacturers so as, to, so as to secure our healthiest possible future. I thank you for supporting the motion. Thank you very much, Brett. Um, I'll just check. Paul Laurie, did you wish to speak or are you just observing? Okay, thank you. And Bill Hare, are you, did, did you wish to speak? Sorry. Yes? Oh, Bill, <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm Bill Hare. I'm um, a resident of Fremantle, um, again, uh, uh, first in the 70s and 80s, and now back here since four or five years. And I have a company here, Climate Analytics, a not for profit company now with seven staff and soon to have eight here in Fremantle on Marine Terrace. And I'm very pleased that this motion has been considered and I've been asked to give you a bit of background on climate science. I'm a climate scientist. I'm involved with the IPCC as a lead author, many other international assessments. And despite my um, years, I'm still very much involved with publishing front range science, including in Nature recently. So, um, just a background on the science context for this. The latest science shows that we need to be reducing emissions by about half by 2030, getting to net zero by 2050. I think everyone's heard that in order to limit warming to the Paris Agreement's one and a half degree limit. What we also know is that this state um, is on the front line of climate change. Um, and that we know that our scientists are telling us that a number of our really important natural systems are beginning to unravel under the weight of, of heat, drought, marine heat waves, and so on. And we can expect these effects to accelerate quickly. Um, they're not static, and they will increase over proportionally with every increase in global mean warming. We know that by the time we get to one and a half degrees warming, based on the most recent science, that we run the risk of triggering major changes on the Earth system, including the disintegration of ice sheets, including the West Antarctic ice sheet, which could lead to meter uh, uh, scale sea level rise by 2100 and many meters thereafter. So that's something that we need to, to know here in Fremantle. Now we know also that carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion, coal, oil and gas is the most important cause of this warming, as well as the cause of ocean acidification. And we know also the work that uh, the scientific community has done that coal needs to be phased out by 2030, and the OECD um, coal globally by about 2040 from the power sector. But what is not well understood by many is that gas also needs to be phased out, uh, not much slower, usually with a delay of about five years. So gas also doesn't have a big role to play. Now, I know many um, gas companies, including Woodside, argue that there's a long transition for gas. But this is not correct. This is not consistent with the science that either we do, the IPCC assesses, or that the International Energy Agency does. In order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, we're going to have to phase out of gas quite quickly. Now, what's positive out there in the world is that there's been a big move towards adopting net zero goals. But there's a dark side to this as well, which has led the UN Secretary General to form a high-level expert group on this. I'm I'm on that group, and actually we're meeting tonight to try and finalise our report. 
Net zero goals cover about 90% of global emissions, but unfortunately only about 6% of these can be described as adequate. Now, along with the rise of net zero targets, we've seen a lot of corporates move to claim that they are doing net zero. But it's turned out that a lot of these claims are essentially greenwashing. In other words, many of the corporate net zero targets do not actually involve reducing emissions at all. Most and many, um, particularly in the fossil fuel sector, are continuing to increase whilst purchasing or claiming to purchase offsets on the voluntary carbon market. There's very serious concerns that actually this market doesn't work to reduce emissions. Scientific assessments, including those in Australia, indicate that the, the offset market that particularly uh, gas and oil companies are using uh, is essentially fraudulent. In other words, the emission reductions don't really stack up. So what's happening now is that many companies are claiming to be net zero, including shipping cargoes of, of natural gas from this state, from this coast, from Gorgon or from uh, Karatha, claiming to be net zero when in fact they're not. This is what's called corporate greenwashing. It doesn't uh, stack up and it's, it's causing a major problem. Uh, uh, excuse, excuse me, Bill, yep. but we normally have three minutes per person. Okay. Um, so I, I know what you're saying is going to be really interesting, but a lot of other people to do. Okay, so. I've got two Sorry. points left, yeah. but that's okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'll look, I would just contend that many of the claims that we're seeing now from the corporate sector are essentially greenwashing. They're aimed at buying a social license to continue those activities. And that's what the advertising that many of these fossil fuel companies are engaging in, not just here, but around the world is doing. So in the same way that there was a successful movement against tobacco and tobacco advertising, I think there needs to be a movement away from supporting uh, and allowing advertising of fossil fuels, including gas. And I think it's very appropriate for Fremantle as a city council, which has long championed sustainability, to lead the way in that context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Carmen Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mayor and councillors, for the opportunity to speak to you this evening about this very important motion. And I know it's an intermediate step because it re will require further investigation uh, before it finally comes to you for decision. Most of us are now very well aware, and we've heard from people tonight, that the burning of fossil fuels and the expansion of the industry is a major contributor to the destruction of the natural world, which is what I want to talk about, ourselves included. And it's why uh, the usually fossil-friendly International Energy Agency has recommended that there be no expansion of the industry if we're to reach those net zero targets that we've heard about. Since fossil fuel emissions are the major cause of global warming, representing a, around 90% of global CO2 emissions in 2018. And it's now clear uh, that the environmental changes being driven by climate change are disturbing natural habitats, they're causing species decline everywhere, and accelerating what is already a crisis in our natural world. And you know the list, rising temperatures, prolonged droughts, more intense and frequent bushfires are threatening those plants and animals and human beings. While changing rainfall patterns, extreme weather events, such as the poor buggers on the other side of the country are living through at the moment, and ocean acidification are putting pressure on species that are already threatened by other human activities. Just a couple of examples to highlight this, that the relationship between climate change and the impacts on uh, the natural world. In those fires of 2019-20, where nearly 97,000 uh, square kilometres of forest and surrounding habitats were destroyed, it's estimated that an additional 14% of species were likely to be threatened at the, the limit um, of their existence. And I don't know if you know, but heat waves linked to climate change have, has already led to mass deaths of birds and other wildlife around the world. And a recent Australian study found that birds died at a rate three times greater during the hot summers than they do in mild summers. And there are many, many such lists. We also know that natural habitats, of course, play a very important role in regulating climate and can help absorb and store carbon. And losing them makes the task of getting to net zero that much harder. And the loss, as we've heard, affects us too. Our economy, our health, our sense of place, and our connection with nature. Now, it's an attempt to mark this kind of damage that the fossil fuel companies spend over $200 million a year on advertising. It's a big spend, but it's actually a fraction of the billions of dollars that they receive in government-funded subsidies each year. 
meaning taxpayers are effectively footing the bill for those advertising dollars. Advertising and sponsorship by fossil fuel companies aren't designed to influence co uh, consumer behaviour. We're not buying directly for them for the most part, like most product marketing, but to burnish the company reputations in the face of what is now a growing resistance to their products. The advertising is usually highly selective and misleading. Go on their websites and have a look sometime. Focusing on renewable energy solutions and all the good things they claim to be doing in our community. And it invariably excludes the harms from carbon pollution, the ones that I've mentioned and others have spoken to, and the acceleration of gases such as methane and CO2. We're encouraged to look past the reality of the damage that's done by the industry, much like the tobacco industry did over many decades, and to accept their distorted view of reality. I have to say now, I was pleased to see in the last 24 hours that misleading claims are now to be investigated by the competition watchdog, the ACCC, which has announced a crackdown on greenwashing that we heard about by Australian companies after global surveys have showed that as many as 40% of the claims made about environmental action, particularly about, around climate change, including net zero programs, may indeed be fraudulent. So we're asking you to help in a rapid shift to cultural attitudes to transition to a decarbonised economy, a decarbonised world, one that will save many species and improve human health. And in my view, that means employing all the measures at our disposal, including the ones you have at local government level, including banning the advertising of fossil fuels. Fremantle Council, uh, an organisation that's close to my heart, having lived here for many years and represented the area, can show the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we have Talia Golaski. Yes, my name's Talia Stolarski and I live in White Gum Valley with my two young daughters and partner. I'm here as a Fremantle resident um, who is strongly opposed to Woodside's shameless sponsorship of Surf Life Saving WA's Nippers program. Um, as a mother, I take my kids to Woodside Nippers on the weekend down at Leighton Beach. I confidently attend with my kids in, the, in their uniforms that have been altered to exclude the word Woodside from five rather large obvious placements. And I get a concerning level of perplexment when it comes to offering an explanation to other parents. I usually try to explain what goes on in my head. The idea of chatting to my kids in 30 years time after watching yet another humanitarian crisis unfold in a world that is becoming increasingly more hostile, and they're asking why. Why didn't you do anything when you had the opportunity? They're frustrated, because in 30 years' time, they won't have the privilege of being able to fight for humanity, at least not at the same level of opportunity we have today. And then, of course, they want to know, how could I knowingly let them walk around at five years of age wearing the name of one of the companies pocketing massive profits at the expense of their very own future. They were kids, they didn't have a say in the matter, but we did, as their parents and their community. Surely policies could have prevented, at the very least, our kids from having an unconsenting role in the success of the industry that knowingly propelled us over irreversible tipping points and into the world as it stands to be by mid to late century if we don't take action now. But back to Leighton Beach on a summer Sunday morning and having just delved into what uh, I just said then, a scientifically accurate depiction, uh, parents often look at me sometimes bewildered, uh, sometimes with concern, but the general response is, oh, I couldn't do that. I couldn't colour in the woodside on the uniform, but that's great that you did. Whatever their reasoning is, friends that work at Woodside, social connections that are somehow relevant at the surf club, not being as passionate or rebellious as myself, too shy, it all comes down to the same bottom line. Because why can't you? Obviously you can physically, so any excuse must be the result of some kind of learned association that excludes Woodside 
from being subjected to a conscious opinion that would otherwise apply to any business responsible for things like loss of ecosystems, mass destruction of ancient rock art, and the gradual breakdown of planetary boundaries. For the rest of the morning, the Woodside name sinks into our subconscious and becomes associated with every gleeful smile and heartwarming accomplishment of our nippers. My surf club friends are inadvertently placing the seeds of this very same deeply rooted social fear in the subconscious of those around us. And so continues the wash cycle of Woodside's reputation. And with so much indisputable evidence in front of us today, the threat these companies pose to humanity, it is wonder that we are even questioning the ethics of allowing them to slap their logo on the heads, backs and chests of our youngest generation, totally oblivious to the fact the company is knowingly subjecting them to a future of ever increasing levels of human suffering. Talia, I think you've got it. I've just Sorry. got one okay. paragraph left. <laughs> Uh, despairingly ironic, the impacts will be disproportionately worse for our children than for ourselves. As a marketing and comms graduate, I may be oversensitive to seeing through both the day-to-day -day greenwash and the intricately spun web of psychological tactics the likes of Woodside engage in, but why should we need a university degree to establish the intentions of a company engaging in business that is undisputably of such great consequence to humanity. By allowing fossil fuel companies to continue advertising and sponsorship business as usual, we are denying the WA public and future generations the chance to form their own informed opinion on climate change, free of the con coercive control by the industries accelerating it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I've got a tickle in my throat. <clears throat> couple of us have got it. Um, it's, um, I, I haven't got COVID, so it's just a, <clears throat> um, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, now, I'm checking if there's, I think there's one more speaker who's online, who wants to speak on his own, is that correct, Donna? online. Um, I did me mean to mention at the beginning of the meeting, <coughs> have I got there? Okay. Uh, that we do have a new director of planning in our midst. Um, we have Mr. Russell Kingdom, who's over here, who's just taken over as the director of, it's a very long list of things, but <laughs> of urban planning. Yes, so um, He's only just come on board just the other day, so we're very pleased that he's taken taken on the role. Formerly, he was manager of, of urban strategic planning in our midst. Yeah. To speak on item eight. Oh yes, it is too. Yeah. No, I was just trying to. This this person's not there. Okay. Um. Mr. Woodcock, would you like to speak on item eight? Good evening, everyone. I'm a resident of White Gum Valley, and I saw this um, motion as I've seen a few things similar to this in the past. And while I have no doubt that this, say, humankind has a massive impact on the planet, and I'm 100% sure we do things that aren't good for it, I would just ask the city, considering how many vehicles and things you operate run on ice or fossil fuels, isn't it a bit hypocritical that you will use our ratepayer money to fund the groups you don't want to take money from that would benefit the community? So I'm a member of the Fremantle Surf Lifesaving Club, and the NIFAS program is an amazing program, 
each year, 500 children pass through that system. Gives them life skills, first aid, resuscitation, water skills, teaches them how to read the ocean. I went through a system that was never as well funded, <coughs> but it's an amazing organization. So I'm just asking, would this motion prohibit, so we've got Twiggy's bought the property across the road, and he all of a sudden has a, a twang of guilt and decides to kick in $10 million for a program to help underprivileged kids or something for the city, is the city seriously saying they wouldn't take that money? That's my question. If you vote for this motion, are you refusing all money in the future and are you blocking volunteer organisations like Surf Life Saving from getting funding? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we, we have yet to discuss the motion, but also the officers will be bringing back a report which we will make a decision on. So at this stage, I'm not in a position to ask the question. So. <clears throat> um, now, was there anybody else who wishes to speak on that item in particular? No, just to check. Okay, I'll just read out the, um, <clears throat> the last one that I had, who was the person we were trying to get online. And... Um, she has presented this. It's Fremantle has declared a climate emergency <clears throat> as a member of the Cities Power Partnership and Climate Emergency Australia. You advocate for climate action in the community and other levels of government, and I thank you for your leadership. However, some policies are yet to be harmonised with your climate emergency declaration. Fremantle's grants and sponsorship policy prohibits partnerships that create an environmental hazard or that promote views <coughs> and behaviours which are inconsistent with the adopted values and policy commitments of the city. But it is not clear if fossil fuels are included. I certainly think they should be. It is also not clear if there are restrictions on which companies or products can take out advertising on council property. On behalf of the members of Comms Declare and the 93% of your residents that support climate action, I ask you consider advertised emissions in your policy, specifically the emissions created by the marketing and advertising of coal, petroleum and natural gas that cause around 89% of global warming. The recent adoption of a national 43% emissions cut by 2030 means we must pull every lever available, not just reducing direct scope one and two emissions, but scope three emissions those created by our customers or residents. Advertising coal, petrol and methane gas stimulates demanding increasing emissions, demand increasing emissions <coughs> and drowning out alternate messages. Sponsorships by fossil fuel corporations is pure marketing to maintain their positive reputation in spite of their damaging activities. <coughs> We estimate just five fossil fuel companies last financial year spent more than $230 million on marketing, increasing demand, greenwashing and buying social acceptance. Seven Australian councils have voted for this motion with cross-party support, including Labor, <coughs> Independents and Greens. The response has been overwhelmingly positive, with the City of Sydney receiving positive media as far away as Turkey and in mainstream media, including the Financial Times and ABC. Linda Scott, President of the Australian Local Government Association, told the Sydney Council meeting, the next phase of going to mark a, is going to mark a very important war in the public relations battle to ensure that people understand <coughs> the need to transition and are not inundated by messages that are either false or misleading or are continuing to promote products that damage our environment. Burning fossil fuels generates particulate air pollution that kills twice as many Australians than car crashes and globally more than tobacco. This is why more than 200 health professionals and organisations support the fossil ad ban campaign. Allowing fossil fuel promotions on council-run assets opens you up to potential criticism for being in conflict with your climate emergency declaration. In summary, this motion would not ban the use of fossil fuels, nor would it stop companies donating money to local groups. It would be a step towards preventing public property being used to advertise toxic products, to stop misinformation and greenwashing and help the Fremantle community create a healthier future. That was by Belinda Noble, founder of Comms Declare.
<coughs> um, I would like to now bring that item forward, this F poll item eight. No, I'm sorry, you can't. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm happy to move that motion, but would Council, could I get a second? <laughs> the Mayor has seconded that. Um, would Councillor Lang like to speak to this item, given that it's his motion? Um, firstly, thanks to all the speakers that came along tonight uh, and spoke on this topic. Um, I was approached by members of our community to bring this motion forward. Um, and after some discussion and consideration, I absolutely thought it was the right thing to do. Um, we are following the footsteps of some significant international campaigns to restrict high emitting companies and brands from advertising. Um, globally, we're seeing countries, France, Amsterdam, and several areas, uh, several UK councils have also moved in this direction. Um, in Australia, it's been, been mentioned, uh, seven other local governments have moved down this path, including the city of Sydney. So I'm, I'm very aware that this one action isn't going to halt climate change. Um, no single action is going to halt climate change. It's about the transition. Climate change can be minimised and halted across the globe as we transition away from fossil fuels. And this action by the city of Fremantle is just one action of what a transition can look like. We are transitioning away from fossil fuels and the restriction of advertising in our community helps that. Allowing fossil majors to greenwash through sponsorship merely drags, um, gives them social license and drags out the transition further. It gives them more relativity in our community the longer that they are able to promote their message. Um, last summer, everyone in this room, we know like, categorically it was the hottest summer ever in Perth. Locally, what we, we know we're seeing, um, in our role in the Southwest Group, um, Ben and I were uh, recently saw a presentation on the um, snake neck turtle, which is living in Fibra Lake and all the wetlands through the Southwest region. But in the presentation, it was touched on that the snake neck turtle now, um, because it, it's warming up quicker and drying out quicker, the nests in which the snake neck turtles are incubating in are warming up faster. And that's triggering a response for the turtles to hatch sooner. Um, the turtles are hatching so soon they don't have the strength or the ability to even dig their way out of their nests. And this is, I just wanted to raise that because that's something local that's happening in climate change. One species of one animal in our region that is suffering and it's causing population loss for the snake neck turtle alone. Even more locally, last summer um, I watched a stand of rottenest tea trees slowly brown off along. Um, Muse Road, where I ride to the beach, five or six Rottenstein tea trees died last summer during that extreme heat event we went through. So it's real and it's happening in our backyard. So this, um, this change, what we're doing tonight won't impact um, our organisation very much, I don't believe. I think the impact will be quite minimal, but the impact helps towards the global transition. Let's join other local governments around the world and Australia um, with this positive movement and investigate what a restriction on advertising may look like. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Aidan, Councillor Lang, for um, bringing this motion. Um, I think it is something that is really timely. Uh, like one of the speakers, I've had the experience of a slightly older daughter asking me why she has to have Woodside on her knickers jumper because she feels really uncomfortable about that. And we need to have those conversations. I think as a local government, we won't be able to control what happens on all of our beaches in all of our facilities, but we can lead the way and we can encourage other people to join us and we can show that there are other ways of achieving outcomes that don't involve taking sponsorship from companies who we're deeply uncomfortable with. The um, recent decision by Perth Festival uh, to end their relationship with Chevron, I think is a great example that an organisation in the arts, which relies heavily on, on funding that comes from other sources, reckons they can make it without having a big oil and gas name attached to them. And I think you know, we, we should very much join them in, in that pursuit. Um, I think our community is one where we are great at stepping up where there is a gap or a need and I think the creativity in our community will be 
where this might have implications for projects and things that we want to do. We've just got to find a different way. So thank you, Councillor Lang, for bringing this and for everyone who's spoken and communicated with us on this issue, and I'll wholeheartedly be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Vucci. It's on now? Okay. I'm going to balance out the argument here um, and balance out the narrative. Um, I wanted on record that I am not for the oil and gas companies and that I understand that there's been um, significant um, environmental damage done through the fossil fuel industry. But it's like anything else, when you have a narrative and only one narrative, then you miss out the whole picture. And I just want to um, level that out somewhat. <clears throat> so be patient with me. Over the last uh, 100 years or so, we have burnt fossil fuels, um, and increasingly so, to give us a very cheap, reliable source of energy. In fact, tonight, we are recipients of it. Very cheap, reliable energy. It has transformed human lives. As a result of that cheap, reliable source of energy, we saw people leave um, very manual, hard-working lives on farms, and it transformed our cities. It, ha it gave us uh, an opportunity to work at night. It um, gave us a lot more control in, in our human endeavour. It was also responsible for the, the big technological and scientific um, advances that we've made. Nothing is for free. The fossil fuels have also had a damaging effect on our environment. Let me also give you an example of the progress of efficiencies that that industry has made since the 1970s. I'd like you to consider your frost-free fridge. In the 1970s, one of my jobs was to defrost our fridge. It was quite a task. Now, because you have this single source of relatively cheap energy, we have a technology where the fridge defrosts itself through heating and cooling. Once again, there is a downside. The CO2 carbon uh, emissions are causing a climate change. However, the race for green renewables is not free. Wind and solar farms are not free. Electric cars are not free. We can certainly put uh, tags and, um, uh, on, on our, um, for example, that something is carbon neutral. But behind the scenes, we need to have a look at what is happening. This environment, which we so love, which has been degraded by solar fuels, is also being degraded with the rush for wind and solar uh, renewable energy. If we have a look at the solar and the wind, um, we have a look at the amount of birds and animals that are being killed, being killed on a huge scale. It takes 80 tonnes of steel which has to be mined and manufactured, and 1,400 tonnes of concrete for the base of one wind turbine. In addition, when you're constructing wind turbines, you, you have anything up to 100 kilometres of access roads that are often built through pristine environments and environments where we think it doesn't matter. But they do matter because there are living organisms that live there. We also need to have uh, power lines connected to them, which often decimate the trees. Since 1966 in the UK, 40 million birds have been killed. And as, they, as the demand for green energy increases, there is more and more agricultural land being used up, which leaves less and less land to be used for food production. The key components of the electric vehicles um, are 
batteries and magnetics. And to be able to manufacture them, um, you would need to um, mine rare uh, earth minerals. Now, I'm only going to touch on three, lithium, cobalt and graphite. Without those minerals and the mining of those minerals, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be having the electric cars that we have at the moment. The countries where this rare earth minerals have been mined are China, Chile, Bolivia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Australia. We've got significant deposits here as well. Presently, the mining of these rare minerals is similar to the, the big gold bodanza rushes of the 19th century. The impact of this mining on the health of the local communities are horrific and the destruction of the local environment is on a grand scale. Now we've had wind turbines, particularly in Germany, for some significant amount of years. In fact, they have been decommissioned. What I find very distressing is that these wind turbines also have these rare minerals in them. They're just as poisonous, uh, perhaps a little slightly less so than, um, than um, nuclear energy. There is no plan for the sustainable recycling of the wind turbines. No, excuse me, I'm speaking. Excuse me, I'm speaking. Um, there are turbines left in rural areas and there's no plan for them for recycling. If we are going to have no advertising, and once again, I am not here to be an apologist for the oil and gas company, but to sit here and not have the other side of the story and give an illusion that the renewables are free and that we are not um, doing environmental damage of equal proportion. I'll give you an example. China has been doing a great deal in terms of their electric vehicles. For them to be able to meet the demand in the next 20 years that have to mine the rare earth minerals five times what the earth has got to offer right now. So we're going to be pressed with some really significant environmental problems and it will come from the green renewable energy industry as well. So therefore, I won't be supporting the motion. Um, Councillor Thompson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I got just, I, obviously I support this motion. I think it's very sensible. And I think, Councillor, as Councillor Lang has said, the actual effect uh, on a practical sense is not going to be great. Um, I think it's more a sending a message about where we would like to be on this issue. Um, excuse me if I'm lisping, I have a tooth from. Um, I would also like to point out, it's, it's, it's very easy to get carried away with, you know, oh, the impact on, you know, on, on us, but the example given there of, of um, Free Metal Surf Club, it's free metal surf club is not will be not affected at all. They can do what they like. They, they can take their money from wherever they like. They can take the ten million dollars that was mentioned, if it's offered them, because they are not a council-owned property, and they are not council-managed. And indeed, I'm pretty sure they're not even on council land. I think it's state government land. So, you know, let's not get carried away with with you know there's going to be this huge impact on things like the nippers and stuff because that will make no difference. Could I also suggest that the officers, when they look at this, when they bring back a report, I think this is this is the kind of motion that it would be very useful for myself and the fellow uh, Walga stake um, uh, local government members to actually take to the zone and to try and craft a motion that we would put to Walga. I think, to be honest, I think um, this sort of motion at the Walga level would have a much greater impact, even though it may not be eventually supported, because there are there are some local governments in Western Australia, as you would well know, who are, who are more than more than uh, supported by uh, organisations like Woodside. So, look, I'm I'm more than happy to support this motion. Councillor Moffat. 
Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm equally, equally supportive of the motion and thank Councillor Lang for bringing it and for the members of the community who um, have been part of this campaign. And I just wanted to, I suppose, point out a couple of points. Um, really sound suggestion from Councillor Thompson about um, taking this to um, the Walga zone and looking to have a broader impact from that. And for me, the, the purpose of this uh, motion is around um, both or two parts. One, uh, provoking thought and people understanding and thinking about uh, change which is, uh, which is required and there's no argument in regards to that. Um, but it's also um, providing the opportunity for us to, to have that conversation and understand where we want to be as a, um, as a community. So to Councillor Vusick's point, I don't think anyone disputes that um, there is a need for managing our transition away from fossil fuels effectively and um, making that as safe as, as it possibly can be, but there is a need for us to um, move away from fossil fuels and if there is a small step we can contribute towards that, I'm fully supportive of it. Yeah. Is there any other elected member who wishes to speak? Councillor Rogo? Um, uh, Chair, can I just ask a, a, qu a quick question? Um, it was it was mentioned by a few people here tonight about having a logo on their jersey from one of these companies and how uncomfortable that is. Um, but the the background, as I understand it, from um, this proposal is that it only affects advertising on council property, not necessarily, um, you know, jerseys or clubs accepting sponsorships or grants. Um, can I ask staff if what's up here actually would cover those kinds of situations of people using council and property with, you know company's logo on them that is a oil and gas producer, would, they, would that potentially cover that scenario with, with what's before us? Through the chair, we can only control our own property, we can't control what other people do. Okay, I'll, I'll just flag that between now and, and council I might try to work with them on some words about lease options and things we might be able to put in leases to maybe help tackle that problem if that's possible. If I can just make a comment, this recommendation is, is I need to go away and do a report on it. So that's what that work I imagine will, will exactly encompass. Councillor Panay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, look, um, I agree with Councillor Vucic that there will be issues in the transition period um, from fossil fuels to renewable energy, but I, I see that as another argument. Uh, I'll, I'll be supporting the motion um, because I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that um, pollution, the pollution that is caused by fossil fuel companies and I'm really keen to see what the officers come back with in their report. I, I, I have a, a small concern about uh, the, the funding and whether that'll um, put into question the existence of any of these, these sporting clubs. So I'm sure that's something that'll be covered in the report. And um, yeah, and as Councillor Lang said, I want to thank him for bringing this forward. Um, it's probably not going to have, be the you know the clincher for the to have the desired effect to to curb the use of fossil fuels, but perhaps it's part of the bigger picture. So, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there any other comment? Right. I'll just mention that this um, notice of motion uh, tonight we are determining it, but it, it then goes on to full council in a couple of weeks. So, um, if um, anybody wishes to speak on it again or ask questions, that is an opportunity. So the motion has been moved and seconded. All those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. Thank you. Um, so the mem people who came to speak on that particular item, if they want to go home and have dinner, that's fine. <laughs> and thank you for coming along. Um, and I'll just um, get through the housekeeping and then we'll go on to the longer discussion about bridges and such things. Um, um, which one? Did you bring the thing? Did you bring the thing? Or did you just have a question? I don't know. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just catching up with where I'm at. Yeah, so we'll just do um, item six petitions. <coughs> are there none? No. Uh, deputations. Are there any deputations? There are none. 
uh, confirmation of the minutes of the um, Finance Policy Operations and Legislation Committee, um, dated 14th of September 2022, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favour? Mr. Parry, are you unanimously, unanimously? Thank you. Um, so now we'll go back to the remainder of public question time. Members, 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 members. We'll just do elected member communication as well. Item nine. Yeah, Ms. Mayor, if you just want to add something. So I was invited today to attend a rally at Stuart Place down on High Street, um, which was well attended by both members of that community, but also um, members of parliament who are stepping in to support that community uh, and from both sides of politics. Uh, the rally was really key to sending a message to the owners of the property that Stuart Place is located in, which is the Christian Brothers, who uh, have decided to try and sell that property um, and evict Stuart Place. Stuart Place provides support, counselling, therapy, effectively a home, away from home, um, for people who, when they were at their most vulnerable, as children were abused in care. Um, and they are, you know, effectively being re-traumatised by the actions of the very people in some instances who traumatised them in the first place. Um, there is a call to action, I guess, for everyone to, uh, if they feel strongly about this, to uh, write to the Christian Brothers and other decision-making authorities. There's lots of information on the Stuart Place website, um, but I was pleased to be there today along with Simone McGurk, Dave Kelly, um, Senator Dean Smith um, and a number of other elected people uh, to lend our support to what is a, a really terrible situation um, but one that can hopefully be remedied through strong public condemnation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just also acknowledge that today um, was the funeral of Mr Gurr who was a local Fremantle resident also a former president of Fremantle Society, and um, just acknowledging that, um, it, you know, it was sad that, you know, he, he was a very active member of the uh, Fremantle community for quite a few years. Um, so we'll now move on to... Yeah, just can I just request quickly, Greg, can somebody put a timer on with a, a notification to let the people know that their three minutes is coming Sure, up? yeah, thank you. Um, I was, we were checking it, but yeah. So um, we'll now go back to public question time. And um, can I just ask, Mark, are you here just for one? You, uh, you've listed yourself to speak on item Quarry Street, but are you staying for the bridge item as well? Yep, okay, then we'll, we'll just get through. Okay, all right, well, we'll just work our way through the bridge and then, yeah. Okay, um, so the people who are here to speak on the bridge, we've got quite a number of people and we will be quite strict about the three minutes. Um, and uh, I have asked people if they could kind of, you know, spread around what all, all the comments they wish to make so we don't have too much repetition. But I do respect that each person will want to um, have their say as well. So we'll work our way through it and then... Um, that we'll go into committee. When, when we're in committee, um, we don't allow any um, dialogue with the public. We need to just resolve it between ourselves. So this item is also going on to the full council. It'll be a, a decision of the full council, not of this committee to make a recommendation. So um, I have the first person on the list is Ian Kerr. And the clock starts now. Uh, thank you, elected members. I shall endeavour to keep to it. In 45 years working in transport policy and planning, and 14 on a local council, I have to say I've rarely seen such a flawed report as this. It fails to justify why Fremantle Council should change the position it adopted on the 23rd of June 2021. And in particular, it fails to identify the source of, quotes, community and council feedback to change the geometry of the Canning Queen Victoria Street intersection. Indeed, it takes a very peculiar definition of changing to mean removing altogether. 
it misrepresents community opposition and anger, which is more fundamental than design and relates to both substance and process. We will not be placated with tokenism in the form of pop-ups, especially like the current one hidden away in a narrow corner of the visitor center, and a plan for participation in further design for landscape and public realm when our concerns are more fundamental. The report fails to mention motions passed overwhelmingly at the annual general meeting of directors, the added cost, duration, and disruption of this latest variant, or the need to rezone riverside parks and recreation reserve to roads, which will, I can assure you will attract opposition from many groups and interests beyond Fremantle. It fails also to acknowledge the knowledge and skills of the Fremantle community that could contrib contribute to achieving a better outcome and indeed the community's desire to do so. So just let me reframe parts of the recommendation. In terms of paragraph one or recommendation one, I would add that the current proposal does not appear to have benefited from quote, integrating good urban design as it prioritizes regional traffic movement over place and community. In terms of paragraph two, I would note that the proposed removal of the intersection at Canning and Queen Victoria Street, far from being innovative, is 1960s planning and inconsistent with good modern road planning practice, which avoids busy roads on river foreshores. In terms of three, I would urge committee and council not to support the latest design of the Swan River Crossing project because of the long list of issues that are noted in the recommendation itself. To resolve those requires an open, inclusive, and transparent comparative assessment of both the previously agreed and current proposal. And in terms of four, uh, rather than what can be seen as a rather patronizing approach to the uh, community involvement, I'd ask that you acknowledge that the Fremantle community has right from the start led the fight that led to the chief modification of the original main road proposal in August 2020 to one that closely aligned with the city of Fremantle's preferred option. And secondly, that we have strongly held and clearly stated objections to these fundamental changes from the proposal agreed after extensive community engagement and confirmed by the Minister for Transport on the 2nd of August, 2021. And thirdly, please acknowledge that the Fremantle community has knowledge, skills, and experience to play an effective role in getting this project back on track. In summary, I urge you to reject this recommendation and reaffirm Council's support for what in this report is called the revised concept. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ian, um, the next person is Gina Blakemore. Good evening. My name is Gina Blakemore, South Fremantle resident. Why are we stripping Fremantle of its icon and tourist, tourist attraction? The iconic container bow sculpture was designed by Fringe World Executive, Executive Marcus Canning and installed in August 2016. The City of Fremantle panel of public art professionals, historians and art experts selected rainbows in 28 applications. Colourful and creative, the rainbow is a universal symbol of hope and inspiration. It is the biggest public artwork commissioned by the City of Fremantle at nine metres at its apex. It is eye-catching, celebrates Fremantle life with a nod to the port city, emphasises the significance of the shipping industry at Fremantle Port, and the colourful social fabric of our community. The container bow couldn't be a cheerier way to leave, enter or leave Fremantle. It is all over social media, especially Instagram, and anyone who sees it knows where it is. Driving past, it puts a smile on many local and international faces. To me, it means heading home. Josh Wilson MP attended a community rally with 1,000 people under the container bow in 2017 to manage equality. He has an image of himself with the iconic, iconic container bow on his federal member the Fremantle page. There were two images of the container bow featured in the City of Fremantle annual report 2021 booklet. 
that contained the bones listed in 26 fun and unusual things to do in Perth, number 19, and is referenced by Rainbow on Google or Google Maps. The climax of the ACDC Highway to Hell concert for the Perth Festival finale to celebrate the life of Bon Scott was held under the container bow in 2019. ACDC fans came from all over the world for this event. Like it or not, the container bow can ice from the Fremantle to Perth. It cost $145,000 in 2016. It is part of our urban and social fabric now. It frames the container cranes on North Quay. To dismantle the container bow and store it away would be a travesty. Once it is pulled down, the likelihood of it ever being reinstalled again is probably cost prohibitively. If Canning Highway is not diverted and stays where it is, the container bow can stay happily where it is for future generations to love and enjoy too. Why spend so much money diverting the whole Canning Highway to increase the parking lot and visibility of the neighbour's store, which has no lower windows? It is a utilitarian brick and steel shed built in 1935 that does not engage with the environment and will be saved and bypassed by the new bridge alignment plans from August 2022. A new green space next to the Navy store could be created above the diverted Canning Highway with 14,000 cars going by each day with no one to see. Yet the container bow waved to precious green canopy, established old trees, the last park claim on the Fremantle side river shore, and the iconic significant limestone cliff for shelter for the white duck. I don't know. I know I don't want the container bow to go. If you want it to go, if not, say no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Damon Hurst. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Damon Hurst. I pay my respects to the Wadjak people on whose land we meet. I speak on behalf of my family. We have lived in Fremantle since 1882, 140 years and counting. This is a failure of process. We all make mistakes. This one needs to be reversed before the outcomes in this community get worse. I have a deep respect for our democracy, the cornerstone of which is our COF executive team must be and be seen to be independent of every political party. The plan approved by the Fremantle community in 2021 is materially different to the plan presented by the State Labor Party in 2022, endorsed by our federal member, state member and the mayor. This new plan involves willful destruction of precious natural habitat for no obvious gain and without community debate. Given the above, I don't feel respected by this process. Why is this an us versus them conversation when it should be a we-me conversation focused on unifying our Frio community? The answer is we are back to the future. We're in 2017 having to save the billier wetlands from politicians. The only difference is this time around, the environmental destruction is being actioned by the blue team, not the red team. I can still hear the crack of bulldozer on ancient Banshee, and I can still feel the rift that developed in our community back then. It's a rift that's been reignited by our new east-west entry statement, or the concrete canyons of Terrazzo, as it's known by our bewildered, artistically sensitive community. And now we're going to double down by bulldozing the last of our natural foreshore so we can put a highway on the river. Surely we have more respect for the next generation. My bottom line, I will not accept the willful destruction of our last limestone cliff or the Canning Highway relocating to our foreshore. I won't accept that as a solution because my family has a deep social connection to this foreshore established over 140 years. If you persist with this plan, the first tree you'll be bulldozing will be my family tree. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Lee Martin. Lee Martin. Hi, I'm Lee Martin. I live in South Fremantle. Homeowner there. I'd like to just touch on a couple of points around the Canning Highway diversion. Firstly, the entry statement. Will, how it will be if this is allowed to go ahead as proposed and the buffer aspect as well. So on the topic of entry, much has been made of enhancing the naval stores as an entry statement to Fremantle. Despite this, drivers on the new bridge will skirt rather than approach the naval stores. 
and those on Canning Highway will actually be driving away from it. We will have split entry to Fremantle. Do we want or can we even afford two entry statements? Also, the focus of the traffic flow will be to the detriment of place. When we think of place, what type of place are we aiming for? I'd suggest people, if they had been properly consulted in a meaningful way, would ask that Fremantle be a place to be rather than a place to move through. If the pandemic has shown us anything, it is that people want to be able to enjoy being together in a place and we have a, all have a new appreciation of simply being. Our entry into an urban, is, is into an urban space and into an urban space, that entry should slow traffic, not speed it up. The second point is to do with the buses. So currently 270 buses a day use Canning Highway. Most of these go to the train station via Adelaide Street and Queen Street, close to the heart of the city and our new Wally Up Court precinct. The new proposal takes Canning Highway buses directly along Beach Street um, to and from the station with no intermediate destination. If we're serious about enhancing public transport access, we should be adding an inbound stop on Adelaide Street between Point and Queen Street rather than removing the outbound stops. I can actually speak personally as someone who made a conscious decision when they moved to Fremantle four years ago from Queensland not to have a car. So I actually really rely on public transport. And I'm actually very happy with the way it works for me going to and from Fremantle. Um, thanks for the opportunity for speaking. Thank you, Lee. Um, Alex Jones. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Jones. I'm a local resident living at the um, Heirloom Apartments, uh, which straddles between uh, Beach Street and um, Queen Victoria Street. I'm also the chair of the Council of Owners there, and I represent 183 apartment owners, um, many of whom are concerned about the, the potential impact uh, the current Canning Highway realignment proposal uh, will have on our homes. In particular, we are concerned about the thousands of additional vehicle movements along Beach Street. Um, currently, at peak times, we already have egress issues uh, coming from the development. So we have cars backing up into the car park around 7.30, 8, 8.30 in the morning, uh, and that's only going to be exacerbated by the, the additional car and vehicle volumes. Uh, we are also concerned about the additional movements along Jane Street and Parry Street, where traffic heading east will now have to travel along Beach Street rather than the current left turn from Queen Victoria Street. Traffic turning onto Beach Street from Jane Street uh, especially the right-hand turn is, is already very difficult due to constricted um, sight lines, so this will make it harder. Uh, crossing and turning movements at Queen Victoria Street will also likely increase at Parry Street further down the road. The proposal will also result in the loss of the direct low-intensity route into and out of Fremantle as an alternative to the busy Canning Highway that a lot of, lot of people actually rely on. As a design professional working for one of Australia's leading design firms, where I regularly engage with traffic engineers, the lack of basic traffic modelling at this stage is concerning as key decisions are being made without it. As a British architect with nearly 10 years of practice in this wonderful part of the world, I have a responsibility to ensure that our urban built form outcome is of the highest possible quality. The realignment of the Canning Highway down, the, down to the River Foreshore is a very poor solution that will negatively affect the beautiful asset that we have on our doorstep for years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lisa Barnes. Hi, I'm Lisa Barnes and I live in South Fremantle. I'm a resident, um, of ex-resident and homeowner of, um, from East Street um, in Fremantle. I lived there for about 10 years. And I'll be elaborating on the impact to the area immediately bordered by Kenning, Sterling, Queen Victoria Street, um, as well as Riverside suburbs and neighbouring areas. The shift for off Kenning Highway onto the river means the loss of our beautiful meandering drive, which goes from Victon all the way through to South Fremantle with just one set of traffic lights. Um, it goes along the river and also um, weaves through the, the heart of um, the Esplanade and Fremantle, all the way down to South Fremantle. Um, this road is a shared use zone. It's highly popular with all age groups, elderly people, disabled and the like, um, putting a, 
highway through this area is not going to be ideal. The closure of Canning Highway will have impacts from traffic flowing in all directions um, where the closure occurs, east, north, west, south, on residents, on local streets and businesses in the broader area. 6,000 vehicle movements are said to occur on Beach Street each day. And these vehicle movements will now have to cross Canning Highway to get into Fremantle. These same vehicles will make a choice of whether to turn west, crossing Canning Highway to get into Fremantle, or to turn east, away from Fremantle. Being a left-hand turn, east will be an easier option for many. Deviating, uh, deviating down East Street will become an easier journey for many, past a primary school, a high school, and many, many residential homes. They may choose to duck down a side street to avoid the traffic, putting additional pressure on currently quiet residen residential streets, such as Burt, Finnerty, Malcolm, and Dorothy Streets. There will be many rat runs created by blocking the, thro the through flow of Riverside Drive and Beach Street. Traffic coming from the east along Canning Highway will be diverted to Beach Street's current alignment. Um, for those coming into Fremantle, it will be totally confusing where the ridge line drive that they're currently taking will all of a sudden be switched to another road. And for a lot of people, um, that will be just a bit too much. And will they then choose to come back to Fremantle again? Traffic coming from the northern suburbs to suburban Frio areas behind the naval stores in the East Fremantle George Street precinct will um, also have great difficulty getting to those areas. They will not be able to turn left off Queen Victoria Street and there's no right turn from Stirling Highway. So cars will be forced down a side street such as Burt Street and James Street in Fremantle and in East, street, in East Fremantle, Marmion, King, Sewell, Glide, Hubble, Council and May Streets. And it will take more vehicles down quiet suburban streets and past more schools and primaries and the like. This pressure bubble will put additional secondary pressure on other quiet streets. I will summarise. Um, these changes will create undesirable and dangerous rat runs and detrimental knock-on effects to people, streets and schools in the Arts Centre precinct, Plimpton Ward, Riverside suburbs and North Fremantle and also businesses in the Fremantle CBD as Canning Highway, Riverside traffic and business, uh, businesses Sorry, Riverside traffic and buses bypass it. It will impact George Street precinct as people will find it difficult to get there. North Fremantle will become a big highway rather than the peaceful shopping area that it is now. We can achieve a much better outcome for Frio. The redirection of Canning Highway to Beach Street will be detrimental in so many ways for our residents, our businesses and our neighbouring suburbs. Is it really worth it? Um, Lisa, uh, we move to Sally Matthews. Hello, thank you for listening to my input. I'm actually a resident of East Fremantle and I do have a business in Fremantle. And so I will speak on the re proposed realignment of Canning Highway regards to Fremantle. Uh, the disconnection of Atterdale, Bicton, East Fremantle to Fremantle. The role of Beach Street for the communities of Bicton, Ashdown, East Fremantle and Fremantle is essential for day-to-day -day commuting and the feeling of, the, of community for the local residents. East Fremantle does not have much in the way of shopping, business and civic areas and is a small town. The Beach Street link is used a number of times daily by community members to access the facilities of Fremantle, the Fremantle Centre and the services it provides. Even with the current use of Beach Street, the daily traffic at the intersection where Preston Road meets Canning Highway is heavy and delays are significant on um, accessing Canning Highway. With this proposal, this conge congestion will be magnified significantly. The reduction of this east-west connection from currently six lanes, six lanes of access to two lanes with traffic lights under the new bridge will significantly affect the access to Fremantle for residents of East Fremantle, Bicton, Ashdale, and likely impact their decision to visit the city. Uh, the alignment of Canning Highway obstructs ac access to the river. 
connection to public open space on the river foreshore is to be celebrated and prioritised. People love to use the foreshore path to get to Fremantle and this experience to be a visual and sensory relief from busy lives through walking, cycling, driving, le driving leisurely, leisurely past the river. The Riverside Drive is a scenic drive, walk, run, a breath of, breath of fresh air that avoids traffic lights, trucks and noise and the highway. The, this proposal prevents people from connecting with the river, rather the community interface is with the highway. The location of the highway on the foreshore reserve degrades amenity, ecosystem, habitat and is entirely out of step with considerations for environmental priority. Um, Margaret first. I am a newcomer to Fremantle and since I arrived I have often struggled with the philosophy of social media debate. I'm a former academic and I thought I was comfortable with robust debate. But debate in Fremantle often goes beyond academic ferocity. Perhaps this is what happens when we give too much weight to community viewpoints and too little to shared community values. So just what are our values in Fremantle? I must say I was quite gobsmacked when I opened up the papers for tonight's meeting. Are we really a community that places a higher value on the precise configuration of a much needed toilet block than on a major infrastructure project? Obviously not. And as a former public servant and an archivist for community groups, I know there is no direct correlation between the amount of paperwork generated and the importance of the issue. I also acknowledge that everyone involved in the Swan River Crossings project over the past three years has been just doing their job. I know that somewhere out there, there are teams of highly professional engineers and architects breathing away in full knowledge that, the, that many people have already decided that they will hate the outcome. And at our visitor centre now, there are more junior staff perhaps hiding behind their relocated pop-ups. Those issues trouble me. But what troubles me most tonight is that you as a committee are at the pointy end of the whole debate. I can't imagine that most of you thought you were being elected as councillors simply for the purpose of sitting on the FCOL committee. Short straw, perhaps? I choose, possibly naively, to believe you stood for election because you shared and still share the core values of the Fremantle community. Amongst those values is respect for professional expertise, as well as the differing viewpoints. And this, and I hope I'm not going to be banned from the council chamber for saying this, is essentially your bugger moment. This is not what any of us wanted. I believe that the report and the officer's recommendation, while tendered in good faith, in no way represent the real values of the Fremantle community. I'm asking you to recognise that. Please realise that we as a community value our meaningful entry statements. We value our shared heritage. We value our river foreshore, as the local community has done for centuries. Please be guided by our shared values in your voting. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we also have Richard Evans. Hi, my name's Richard Evans. Um, my family's owned property in North Fremantle for the last 45 years. I'm one of the heads of the Save the Fremantle Bridge Alliance. I'm also general manager of the Perth International Jazz Festival. Um, so basically, I'm here talking tonight. I totally agree with all the points made about the foreshore. I think it's an incredible development, having been on this journey for over 12 months now, from um, when it was first announced, the bridge alignment this time last year. And then I spoke to council with my friend Isadora Noble. And then we've carried that journey on. Back then I was trying to save more of the bridge than 21 metres. And now we see that um, with the new announcement, it's all been completely destroyed. And we have this incredible new alignment, which has you know, fired up this community. We had a wonderful politics in the pub two weeks ago. 
which um, Thornton Morby might have attended, but we've got Councillor Sullivan for attending. No one would actually speak on behalf of the, um, the Swan River crossings. Um, Robin Christian asked numerous times for someone to come, even any of the councillors who support the who support the bridge. So we were just left there talking to ourselves and it was a huge turnout. It was one of the biggest turnouts we've ever had. And it was actually probably the most moving moment of the whole campaign for me to save the bridge because I'm actually doing this not for myself. I'm doing this for future generations, having lived overseas in some of the you know, big metro metropolises of the world and seeing how they want to save their infrastructure and use it for the younger generations. Um, that's my goal here. I'm not going to die if they destroy the bridge, but I think it's an opportunity that people should at least look into. We had a beautiful moment when a young girl came up to me at the start of the politics in the pub and she'd just written a poem about the bridge unrelated to saving the bridge. And she got up and read the poem <coughs> over a minute and and it brought the, you know, it changed, shifted the whole mood of the crowd because they realised what we're doing this for. And I think the same can be said um, about the foreshore and the access to the foreshore. I think the park at the naval store doesn't have any access to the foreshore, so I think that will be a bit of a white elephant for people um, wanting to cross the highway. So anyway, in closing, I just wanted to say I'm still very concerned about saving the bridge, and we have 10,000 people on our petition, um, and we have we have 500, there are five, when the bridge came up, there are 500 comments about negative comments about the the new bridges on Facebook and stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of support out there still, and I think that it's just the tip of the iceberg. Now that the, um, the Kenny Highway alignment has fired people up, I think this is going to keep going. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'll just let you know, too, that the night that Politics in the Pub was on, I know I had another council um, commitment, and I think many of us did also. I can't remember what it was, but that was the reason. We often do go along to those meetings. So, yeah. Um, Susie Sexton. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm a resident of East Sea Lapwood um, and have lived in the Fremantle area for 11 years, um, having come from the East Coast. I've grown to love this place. Sound a bit, a bit short, sorry. Um, I've grown to love this place and I want to just... Um, share my support for all of the um, speakers who've supported what um, East Fremantle and Fremantle need in um, keeping a place in what is a really important entry area to our bigger picture town. The concern that I have um, really is part of process and also part of considering outcomes. So the process part for me is that when the project was first introduced, um, it was stated that the intention was to replace a piece of infrastructure which was degraded and never planned to be a piece of infrastructure that, that was going to be there forever. That sounds completely reasonable, even if you think it's beautiful and you would love to save the bridge itself if you could. But four options were presented to the community to consider on alignment of a bridge without really showing a design for the bridge either, but just the alignment. And that was all that we, was discussed and considered. Then, after a decision was made about the most appropriate alignment, a new, massively disruptive to um, local traffic movement and people place was presented without any discussion. This is what is being done. I think the concern for me as a local person who lives just up the hill on East Street um, is that I've just witnessed what has been done in a main road-led design project on the so-called high street upgrade. Um, and I do not want to see that sort of um, engineering-based solution inserted into um, such an important entry area to our city. Um, someone else said before that we should be considering slowing traffic, reducing traffic, removing traffic and making places for people in our city, not figuring out how we can slot more cars in more quickly through removal of an intersection. Intersections are good. They slow people down, they allow for multiple movement options, they help people get from here to there. They also help pedestrians and cyclists get around. The arrangement of the traffic flows that are put forward at the moment prioritise the movement of cars. Faster, 
And only faster for a tiny little minute because guess what? They get into pre-match or just around the corner. So what is the benefit of this change? I also support um, a rethink of if we are trying to focus on benefit and on a place-based concept with this project, that should be focused on the foreshore, not on up the hill. That's all. Thank you. I don't believe I have any other speakers registered to speak on this. Oh, Mark Woodcock, uh, would you like to speak now? Sorry, sorry, Mark. Um, so it's quite brief. Uh, good evening. My name is Mark. I think most of you know me. Um, tonight, the FPOL Council meeting has raised the impact of fossil fuels, uh, carbon emissions, things from concrete and steel. Yet, if the council is serious about those actions, we probably wouldn't have built this building, but renovated the other one. The Port Authority has a building from the same architect, similar builders, same time zone. They renovated theirs at Strait. State government did exactly the same with theirs. So if you're serious, I think I said this at the general electors meeting, if you're serious about the messages you put out, then it's time to actually act on them, not just put motions forward to council. If you're really serious about carbon emissions, you wouldn't be supporting a concrete bridge being built down there, you'd be supporting the old timber, which is carbon neutral. So that bridge actually supports your agenda. The new one goes against what you voted for. So I don't really understand the logic of how you make decisions and put those into action compared to what you actually vote, vote for. Um, the old traffic bridge has an A1 heritage listing. So as a member of the Fremantle Society on the committee, the Fremantle Society uh, supports the vision and the work of the Bridge Alliance to protect the Heritage Bridge and to activate any possible tourism activity out of it. I also think the Council should be supporting the bridge, A, for its heritage, but it has an amazing workers' heritage. The people who built it, designed it, cut the timber from down south, dragged it up, the amazing natural timbers of Western Australia, and all of that itself is a great tourist attraction and a tourist, uh, tourist space to talk about. The other part that people sort of miss is that bridge at tight in its form protected the Swan River from a possible naval uh, development that the colony was planning back in those days. So they were talking about a freshwater bay, a military base. They were talking about commercial cargo ports in the Swan River. So that bridge has stopped big vessels from going down there for as long as it's been there. So that's a really important heritage and it saved the ecosystem for the Swan River. So I think that needs to be acknowledged and that's a perfect reason to keep it because do we really want bigger vessels going down the Swan River when they make wider spans higher to allow bigger ships in? Is that the plan? Especially after you just voted to not support diesel and petrol, which is what powers all those vessels that will be going down the river. So I, I really ask the council to look at what they say in those agendas and then put them into action and your action from what you voted on tonight at FPOL would be to protect the old bridge because it's carbon neutral and to stop a massive amount of concrete and steel being landed on our northern entrance. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, please. Oh, I haven't got your name, sorry. Oh, sorry, Paul, you are too. Thank you. Um, well, come up to the mic, please. Yeah. Sorry, I did have your name too. Uh, I'm Paul Loring. I've been a cycling advocate for many decades. And uh, as an accredited Ostcycle coach, I was the preferred supplier of cycling education and training for the city of Fremantle for a number of years. Um, in addition to that, I've been one of the uh, first uh, affiliate members of West Cycle, which is the state level body that looks after all aspects of cycling and, uh, and uh, on top of that uh, along with uh, Sam Wainwright we reinvigorated the Fremantle bug and I mentioned the bug because the bugs uh, were established in the 80s as the representative group of cyclists at the local level and uh, we were established then as a source of information for local councils and, and other government departments. The, uh, and I'm saying this because, you know, from the report that you, you, we've got here today, there was a special briefing of elected members on the 1st of November 2021. 
but we as a bug were trying to be involved with this project prior to that. We'd been involved with it for, for decades, of, of trying to deal with the PSP and how it'd be, it would bridge into Fremantle. We weren't invited to any of these presentations. There's a rationale here as to why the, the PSP cannot go on the railway bridge. The bugs were not involved in that, neither was Westside Bridge. The rationale for the new bridge design, we had not been involved with that, and neither had Westside Bridge. Yet we were established with that very purpose. We as a local group, we live here, we don't just ride bikes, we use cars, we have homes here. Amenity for us is not just about cycle paths. So when the, the proposal came out with the, the PSP going down through Pier Street, I personally was horrified because we'd already discussed this and said, this is unworkable. This is going to be lost amenity for the community there. It's bound to create a, a, a conflict between local residents. It's, it's not a well thought through solution. And, uh, and when you look at the, the, the whole layout and, and the plan of the PSP, it clearly hasn't involved cycle paths. They haven't actually thought through the problems of what's needed, uh, what aspects of the plan are, 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 are dangerous or unsafe for cyclists, and also for other people who share those paths, pedestrians. It's clearly a, a, a poorly thought through plan. The design team, We've tried on many occasions to meet with the design team. We were going to meet with them in August and in September and October, but it still hasn't happened. They will not meet with us to talk about us as the local representatives of cycling in Fremantle about what could be done here. We've got ideas. We've been thinking about it for 10 plus years. So my plea is, you know, can you use your influence to involve us. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Paul. Um, just to check, is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this item? No. So could you give your name, please, and come forward? Sorry, what was your name again? I will be uh, I'll be extremely brief. Um, so uh, I've lived in and around the city of Fremantle for upwards of 20 years and we very recently just purchased a property in Fremantle, um, walking distance from that Fremantle foreshore that was part of this discussion in terms of the, the Canning Highway diversion. Um, I suppose I would just like to urge you as councillors to be fierce advocates for two things that I think um, are priceless assets of the city of Fremantle. One being a natural asset, that being the, the river foreshore there and the limestone. Uh, you can't put a price, you can't put a number on how valuable something so beautiful, so, something so naturally beautiful is. And so I urge you to be fierce advocates to protect that foreshore. And the, the rainbow sculpture, uh, I understand there's the initial cost of actually building it, but what that is now has been transformed by it being a priceless cultural icon and asset in the city of Fremantle. It's so deeply embedded in our identity that to just remove it for a highway seems to me almost sacrilegious. So I just urge you all to think from that point of view as fierce advocates for a beautiful cultural icon and a beautiful natural icon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's the end of the discussion for, by the public on that particular item. Um, and we'll now go into committee and discuss the item. So um, this, this is item eight of seven, I believe. Yeah. Seven, yes. So um, just to let the public know also that we do have um, an alternate motion which will be um, discussed as well and we've also got some information from Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Thompson also submitted an um, alternate motion. So um, as the Chair I would 
move the alternate motion that I put up and submitted um, on time and, um, um, and open that for discussion. So I'll move that motion and that motion um, is the alternative. Yes. Yep, they, I think they're going to do that. Yep. Um, and uh, I'll just ask for a seconder to that alternate motion, seconded by Councillor Pemberton. Oh, um, so I will. I think everybody's read my comments um, from the elected member side. So I'll speak on it a bit later on. But I'll just open it up for discussion. Anybody wish to speak on the alternate motion? Then perhaps I'll close the debate. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Moffran. Yeah, I might as well start then. Um, and yeah, I suppose in the first instance, I uh, wanted to thank staff for the work that they have done uh, in putting the original um, recommendation together. There's always a point that uh, needs to be the starting point, and uh, then to Councillor Archibald and other elected members who have added to that with the uh, with the alternative recommendation. Um, yeah, I suppose pretty brief in regards to this, and, and um, yeah, I, I support the alternative recommendation and just wanted to add a few points to that. And one to kind of say, uh, and just to be really clear on our role, that you know, the bridge plan is not a, a council plan, but it's really important that we um, that we do provide relevant feedback to um, to those designing and, and eventually building uh, the project. Uh, I want to also just go back to um, our motion, uh, or sorry, position from June 2021 and uh, the feedback that we provided and acknowledge that that did point out that there were, in the previous design, that there was limited opportunity to deliver improved transport and land use planning outcomes for urban environments. Now, I think the project has gone away and done some work to try and um, address both those um, land use planning outcomes and, and uh, the urban environment. But there are still questions that remain about how that will impact on residents and, and uh, the greater surrounds and particularly for me the uh, traffic, traffic modelling impacts are not known and, and the impacts both in residents in and around directly uh, in that location but more broadly to the east and, and then moving into Fremantle as well. So I think the, the alternative recommendation uh, does if you like, raise those questions and they're important ones to be answered um, as part of this process. If I look at the other the other points that have been raised as well in the um, the alternative recommendation, I think it, it goes some way to, or it does certainly uh, address a number of the points that have been raised by uh, members of the public, particularly around um, cycling connectivity as well as then the retention or otherwise of the, the limestone cliffs. So I think it is a, a good position for us to have as a council in that we are saying um, the a number of points that we raised previously have been addressed by the bridge project, um, but there, we still have questions that need to be addressed, so I support the alternative recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Sullivan. Um, thank you. Um, I've probably been involved in the urban design issues of Fremantle um, probably as long as anybody else um, in this room, if not longer, um, including as the project architect at North Bank, uh, as the um, person um, who was the um, chairperson of the Light and Action Coalition that actually created uh, the environment that we see there today and saved um, yet another project from destroying a foreshore and many others. Um, and when I started the North Bank development um, as project architect, I spent a massive amount of time up on Cantonment Hill looking back over North Fremantle because it felt like the right place to be considering um, 
what should happen between the bridges. And so not, I not only became incredibly familiar with uh, looking at the north side, um, but in terms of Cantonment Hill, which at that stage wasn't in public ownership, it was in the uh, ownership of the federal government, I um, became incredibly uh, familiar with Cantonment Hill on, on the south side as well. Um, and in, the, in uh, my term uh, as councillor this time around for the last uh, 13 years, uh, I've been heavily involved in the actual getting of Cantonment Hill, and I um, pay homage to uh, people um, in federal politics, um, including Melissa Parks and uh, Josh Wilson, uh, in trying to get um, that hill back into public ownership. Incredible effort and something that we had a working group that spent over, I think, 18 months working on what Cantonment Hill would become like uh, once we had uh, public ownership of it. Um, and one of the things that was really clear in that process um, was that it's an incredibly difficult place to, um, to actually activate, to actually make available to the community. And it still is. We've done a lot of amazing things up there, but it still is a very difficult place to hand back to the people of Perth in a physical sense. I also, uh, as you know, was very heavily involved early on in a number of scheme amendments, one of which looked at the Northern Gateway, which is Queen Victoria Street, and all of the development um, that's proposed up that end of town. Um, so it has a direct connection um, to the way in which the bridge works, and um, I want to speak on that as well. Um, and of course, you know, anyone that lives in Fremantle, we've used those areas um, a lot. What I struggle with with this um, motion is, I guess, the lack of a very clear set of criteria from our community, from our council, as to how to judge any option, let alone three options uh, that have been uh, put in front of us today. And let's not forget, these aren't options. These aren't the state government's options put in front of us today. This is us saying they are options. And of course, we've been asked actually by the state government to say, here is our not preferred plan, here is our final design, um, what do you think? That's not actually what they're even saying. They're actually saying, here's the final design, comment on it if you will, um, but that's the final design, that's what it's called. So I wanted to um, ask if the committee would um, tolerate in part two of this recommendation of the alternative um, to actually try and put in a set of criteria that actually relate to the very things that we should be using to assess. And so in doing that, and, and obviously, you know, it, it didn't reach um, you by midday yesterday, and so it's not uh, in the agenda papers, but this item is going to full council, and I would like to see uh, some consideration of whether or not there is room in our resolution to actually have a set of parameters, a set of criteria, a set of values, I think is the word that was being used, as to how you would measure any design in that environment. So for me, there are a number of things. So I'll just quickly speak to them. The Northern Gateway, which is the development of Queen Victoria Street, was very heavily concerned about how all of those roads in that area would work and how we would make that precinct development ready and inviting enough for um, the sorts of developments uh, that we were seeking there. We've done an excellent job. This council has done an excellent job in the section between James Street and the city centre, uh, where the half of the properties that we wanted to see redeveloped have already been redeveloped, uh, and another two uh, have already got planning approval or are hopefully on the way. The road there has been transformed from being car yards and, and the like uh, to a tree-lined boulevard, uh, which is an exceptional space. The bit that we always knew was going to be problematic was the bit between James Street and the bridge because it carries a significantly larger volume of traffic, um, not only trying to enter the city, but trying to get through uh, the network of roads heading south and north. Um, and that was always the challenge, and that's why even though there have been a number of proposals for that area, nothing has come along. It is not development ready. 
this project provides an opportunity to do that. Um, and that is where the notion of spreading the traffic out a little bit comes from. So for me, the first criteria was um, that we need to be able to look at proposals in this northern section that catalyze development of the Northern Gateway, um, uh, which relies on um, establishing Queen Victoria Street uh, as an urban boulevard. And that concept of then um, trying to spread the, the load of the roads around is, is the one that came, came from that. It doesn't mean you have to put Canning Highway down to the foreshore. Um, it does uh, suggest that Beach Street um, would be better if it was carrying more of the load. It's better to have uh, two roads that are urban roads rather than one road that is, and the one that you're trying to get activated still being a very heavy volume traffic road. So um, the second version was um, that access to the city centre is always, when it's an urban environment, going to be better if the volume of traffic is spread across multiple roads rather than conglomerated uh, into one road. Um, the options to improve the flow um, and the wayfinding into the city centre are another type of criteria that we need to refer to. Um, and I know I'm going to run out of time, so I'll try and summarise fairly quickly. The um, including a signalised intersection between Canny Highway and Queen Victoria Street, i.e. what's there now, uh, we know that that's problematic for the Naval Store, but we also know that there are probably ways in which that could be mitigated. So the mitigation of that type of intersection, if that's what we end up with, needs to be a criteria that we would hopefully include. Um, the foreshore environs. Now, no one imagined at the beginning of this process, that we would see a proposal that put a 17,000 vehicle per day highway closer to the foreshore than Beach Street currently is, because that's what's actually uh, the final design. Now, you know, having fought for so many foreshores, I cannot believe that we don't have a criteria that basically says that the foreshore environment, including the area between the river foreshore and the wharf um, in the harbour, which is a critical pinch point between the two, um, um, should be prioritised for public recreation, be capable of activation and not be dominated by high usage roads in close proximity. So that's one of the criteria I'd love to see in there. Um, and the, uh, the, the one relating to Cantonment Hill is that the integration and functionality of Cantonment Hill, including Tuckfield Park and the Naval Store, uh, would be greatly improved by options that directly connect the foreshore um, with that environment um, on the hill. And the last one would be one that covers the issue of conservation and the cultural uh, environments. Um, obviously, any design should optimise um, the, the things that we already value. Um, and that includes the built environment, the buildings, um, and some of the uh, elements that are already uh, recently added and much loved, um, and the old ones, uh, but also the, the natural environments. And I don't see very much in the proposals that have come forward and the conversations that have come from the Alliance that actually deal with the um, cliff faces, the importance of limestone and caves and the water sources that are down there uh, along the river that used to actually serve um, the breweries that existed there. So we don't have criteria in any of this recommendation. So the recommendation is asking for government to do more work, to provide more information, and to allow us and community to actually assess these options um, further. So I think the very first place that you would go to if you were asking that, is to set some criteria. We probably should have set them as part of our resolution in 2021, knowing that we were kind of like signing off on the alignment and then entering a phase where um, the alliance would be uh, looking at these things. We probably should have set it back then. But I guess we probably thought that there would be meaningful consultation and um, participation um, in what is clearly needed to be an iterative design process rather than just getting a final design, uh, what do you think, uh, lumped on us, uh, and then asking for an iterative process. 
because I suspect we're not going to get that. That said, we have to try. We have to try as hard as we possibly can. And the reason I want to see a bunch of criteria or values put in the very top of the recommendation is so that we understand how to measure each of the different options. Um, if it gets to it, I um, would also like to, to speak about some of the detail further down, but I, I'm getting the impression that um, there isn't going to be a lot of debate about each individual line item. So I'm just talking about part two of the recommendation, and I'd uh, very much like to, to hear what other people's thoughts are in terms of uh, establishing those criteria rather than just sort of launching into, oh, I like that design and you like this design, um, and, and that's about it, because that's kind of like meaningless. Um, thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Um, I do um, acknowledge that um, th this is going on to full council, so there will be opportunities for um, input. And I know you've circulated the um, little spreadsheet with um, suggestions in it, so I would suggest that um, you know more work can be done on this between now and full council, where we can all have a bit more conversation about the future of the expo. Um, this is also a committee meeting, and you are allowed to speak twice. So, <laughs> uh, Councillor Groom. Uh, thank you, and thank you for um, the work that my colleagues have done on the alternative motions this week, um, particularly Councillor Archibald, but I think everyone's had a look at it and a say, and certainly for the work that Councillor Sullivan has done in just trying to put together something meaningful. And I need to really thank the community, because when I first looked at these options, I thought, oh, less bitumen, that's probably a good outcome, isn't it? Um, and I've been really convinced over the last few weeks by the kind of compelling conversations I've had with various members of the community as to why actually, in this instance, less bitumen is a rubbish outcome. Um, uh, and I do understand that there's a whole range of problems that the Bridge Alliance were trying to solve when they came up with their solution, but they haven't shown us what those problems were um, and invited us in that conversation or to understand why they've put forward what they have. And I'm certainly finding the argument that um, we should be learning from the 70s and that roads on coastal um, foreshores don't make sense anymore. And I, and I have a really big question mark over future land use at the port and what that will mean for traffic on Beach Street, if that's the only way in and out of that area. Um, and it's really hard to imagine that that would stay at a two-lane road. So um, you know, lots of question marks for me. So I was certainly, um, if the um, uh, recommendation we had, had put in front of us goes forward to full council in two weeks, I will be unable to vote to vote for that. I don't get a vote for tonight, but I um, am supportive of uh, the motion that has been put forward as an alternative, which essentially says not enough information for either this council or the community to understand that, and really not enough information for you guys to have landed on a position, because you haven't even decided how many cars are going to be on that road, let alone a number of other things. So, um, yeah, I'm hopeful that members of the committee will support um, something at the end of what's up and certainly um, you know maybe we've got the opportunity to develop that further with some of the ideas you're suggesting. Thank you. Um, Councillor Kamada. Thank you, Councillor Archibald. Um, look, I'd just like to thank the speakers for coming tonight. I think um, it's been really impressive uh, what you guys had to say between you all and, and, uh, and I really appreciate listening to you. Um, yeah, I, I thank, beginning with the officers, what, what you guys put together and, and obviously Councillor Archibald and Councillor Sullivan, I really appreciate what you've added to this. I came here hoping that we'd finish up with something that opens up the debate again and gives us the opportunity to get more information and the community obviously a, a, a chance to also to, to get more information and, and, you know, hopefully we'll end up with a much better result than what we're seeing right now. I think the the um, land use, the latest option, land use and planning outcomes and urban design are questionable. 
I don't think for the money that we're spending, we're going to end up with something that that is better. And uh, if that's going to be the result, then I'm pretty disappointed. So yeah, I'll, I'll support this motion with the view that it's going to go to full council and we've got time to, to develop it even further. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Graham. Uh, I've got Councillor Graham's microphone. Oh, sorry. Oh, of course you <laughs> I'm happy to be Councillor Graham. Good evening. Um, yeah, just a few comments. I think um, Susie Sexton now that and it kind of reminds me um, some things I've thought before is that this bridge, it's, it's, it's not been designed, it's been engineered. And that's really apparent. We're still waiting for the design element to come through. Um, and the other, other bit that I'm really concerned about is um, it, it is all about how we're getting cars in and out of Fremantle easier. Um, and main roads are future proofing that, assuming there's going to be more and more cars coming in out of Fremantle. And I'm really worried about what that means for our city in the future. Um, and furthermore, the, the whole Perth element um, about main roads is, and our urban environment, the whole urban environment of Perth is being designed and governed by a roads board, and that's, that's a pretty scary thought as well. Um, moving on to the, the PSP, and Paul, thanks for raising all those points. Um, I don't know whether we change it here or maybe we can do it next week, but it's in section one and point two. Um, We've, we've written integrated cycling facilities on the new road bridge. And my, my concern is that we're locking ourselves to the road bridge when I'm not convinced that's the best solution for the PSP. Um, we know that if we're using the rail bridge for the PSP, it's going to solve many issues, including the landing on the southern side. And also, if the PSP is on the rail side, it means there'll be far less crossovers and roads and provide that streamlined uh, ride straight through to the train station. So whether it's now or later, but I was wondering if we may be able to rem remove that the comment about the new road bridge and just have integrated cycling facilities on the bridge which provides best PSP facility. Whether whether it's uh, in this meeting or the next one, but that's just something I've picked up because we are locking ourselves into the, the one option there and I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. I was just having a look at it, whether we, if we took out, instead of noting the following advancements, if we just not say noting the following since the previous round of community consultation, we're not calling it an advancement, and that way we could just leave it in because that's where it is proposed. Would that satisfy your concern? And then you can fix it later on when you get into it. Um, so I'll just take the word advancements out um, because that... That just does, that sends a bit of a message about whether it's good or bad or indifferent, and that way it's just there. It is. It's that's where it is, and um, carries on to the full council. Okay. Um, so I'll make that my amendment. Is everybody happy with that? Yep. Just the word advancements. Okay. Um, Council Thompson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, just just for clarification, I guess perhaps the public might be a bit confused. They're actually, your people have been talking about the alternative recommendation. This is not an alternative recommendation. This is, in fact, an amendment to the current recommendation. The alternative recommendation is the one that I have there. Uh, can I just speak just for a moment to it? I, I, I'm, I'm not going to pursue that alternative recommendation, but I would just simply draw Council's attention to the fact that all of the information in my so-called alternative recommendation is actually exactly the same information that is in the amendment recommendation that, uh, that the chair put forward um, is just simply organised differently. Uh, and because, to be quite honest, I found the, the current recommendation before us, as, as a person trying to read it and get the information out, that I'm quite happy with the information that's in there, but I just think from a, a reading point of view, it, it's actually quite difficult to extract exactly what we're on about. So what I would request is that obviously this will have some further work before council, is that perhaps officers could consider the way that I have, whatever information, whatever amendment we arrive at, that the, that the way that it is organised could be in this way, because it, because currently we are actually, uh, we are providing commentary uh, in this current recommend, the amendment that we have, we are providing commentary, we are required, we're providing a request for information, 
and we're, we're providing a request for uh, further planning to take place. So really, that's the essence of the, that's the guts of what we're trying to do. Everything else is detail. So if I could just ask officers to take that on board as, a, as an example of how it perhaps would be better presented. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Thompson. I'll just add that, yes, I started out um, making amendments to the, uh, to the motion, and when I got it back, um, it, they'd rephrased it as alternate motion, so I got, kind of felt like perhaps they'd decided it was different enough to be an alternate motion. But I'm very happy for your... I, I agree that it could be organised differently, but for the sake of expediency tonight, to sit and, uh, and maybe during the next two weeks, just to come up with some of the other work that you and Councillor Sullivan have done. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now we have Councillor Vucci. Yes, I just want to thank the community. You're absolutely awesome and dogged in um, the pursuit of this issue. Um, I want to thank uh, Councillor Sullivan uh, for his uh, work. And um, I'm not going to add anything more to it. It's already been said, but certainly I look forward to the additional work that's going to be done in these couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pemberton. Um, thank you. And yes, I'll just kind of speak to the very high level aspects at this stage, um, noting the amount of work and effort that's gone into these amendments and changes. And and I guess particularly for the purpose of the people in the gallery today, um, you know, recognising that our power and control over this project is virtually none in the Camille. We don't actually have um, decision making authority over this in any way, shape or form, but um, we do have a role to play in trying to make it the best outcome it can be for our community. Um, and so I do think that's where we have kind of the most, if, if we can make sure that, you know, the concerns and the issues that have been um, raised and so on that we think, you know, might be able to be resolved. It, it's about actually highlighting the need to do some further work and resolve the, the things that we think are still outstanding issues. And I think many of those have been mentioned. Um, there's also some really contradictory kind of um, information or assumptions coming through that I think need to be um, fleshed out and better understood. You know, I've long been an advocate of road diets, but the idea of six lanes of traffic going down to two and that just working um, is fascinating. And if we're going to step away from cars to that degree, that's great, but I'm not sure it's going to work like that. Um, I also think the work that Councillor Sullivan has done has been tremendously helpful. I think um, the concept around, you know, sort of tunnel-type options, I'm certainly coming around to that idea. I don't know whether or not it's even vaguely possible to get the government to do that, but I do think it's a conversation worth having. Um, and, and in whatever we put um, in this final decision when it comes to council, I do think we need to be really, really clear about what are the things that we value most highly and want to see protected through this process and, as, you know, and not get too lost in the detail as well, but make sure we've got real clar clarity in our message about that. Um, the Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Archibald. Um, I've got quite a lot to talk about, but I do want to go to the criteria, and I think Councillor Sullivan's um, hard work in trying to uh, put in place some, some thinking around criteria, and really this is going to be about criteria, updating the criteria that we did have back in, I think it was 2020, um, which we submitted to the Bridge Alliance and to the state government to tell them what we wanted out of this. Interestingly, some of those things have actually probably resulted in where we are now. We asked for, you know, uh, strategic planning around connection through to port and things like that, and I'm, I'm summarising, and Gil Regis can, you know, uh, do some good work on it. Um, the, the uninterrupted flow between principal shared path, things like that. Um, excellence in design, and the jury's probably still out on that. We did want to preserve some of the old bridge at that time, and I think reality has caught up with us there. Um, Aboriginal significance, which I guess is one of the things that has informed the current thinking around the bridge, is, is what do Aboriginal people want, and they definitely want less stuff in the water. Um, but we also asked for increased curtilage in front of the naval stores and Canning Highway. Um, and that North Trio town site was, was protect, protected through this. So I just think it's interesting to go back and look at those criteria and think about what, what have we learned since then and what do we now need to capture about where we are now. 
Um, I think it is really beneficial for us to provide clear guidance. So I, I support waiting through till next to the next couple of weeks to council where we can all get really clear on that about what we value because values is the critical question in this conversation and I think probably around the room we agree on a number of them. So the importance of public open space, ensuring there are attractive, safe and accessible connections from the top of Cantonment Hill right down to the river, putting the needs of people before cars, taking a long-term view of what will benefit the community beyond those of us who are just here and now. Um, but we'll all bring different views as to what best achieves these objectives, and, and that's democracy. Um, and this debate is really a great case in point of democracy. We can share values, we can come to a variety of conclusions about what best allows us to achieve them. Um, I think, so, you know, people might want to say, well, you know, we should do some things, advocate for things that, that aren't feasible and are basically off the table. Um, I think we also need to understand that when we want to be heard in these conversations, we need to be credible. And we need to accept we're not going to win all the arguments, but it's better to be in the room having them than outside the room achieving nothing. So we've all, and this goes for council as it goes for me, and it probably goes for the community as well, we've got to walk the fine line between advocating and antagonising. Uh, whatever happens, if this project goes ahead, and I don't see why it won't, um, given the assessment of the, the bridge, there are going to be major changes in this area. The new bridge is higher. It's higher for a number of reasons, you know, um, significantly uh, the potential for sea level rise. It'll have consequences for all the surrounding roads and facilities, and there is absolutely no perfect solution. The fact that the rainbow will have to move under any of the options that main roads have presented to us is a testament to this. There are new road standards, there are new lane widths, there are all kinds of things. Uh, that said, with the rainbow, we can reassure those who are concerned that we are in good discussions with the artists and, and there are other good locations for it to sit and continue to be iconic. But I guess we're all doing what I'm doing, which is weighing up the pros and cons of the options. We've, we've heard and I've de deeply listened to and I acknowledge a lot of the challenges with realignment of Beach Street or Canning Highway, but we also know there are big issues with keeping the current alignment. The roads are going to be up to two metres higher than they are now to allow for connection to the, to the new bridge, to the higher bridge. And that'll be a really hard barrier between Cantonment Hill and the riverfront. And of course, most of the, much of the population of Frio who live to the south of, of Cantonment Hill. When you're higher up, it's harder to get down and there's difficulty around connecting people on foot, on bikes, with kids on scooters and in wheelchairs to the foreshore. So neither of these options is perfect. We need to be really clear on what we think we can influence and how we want to do that. We're also in an unfortunate position where we don't control this project, as many people have referenced. There are elements we would have done differently. I think particularly when it comes to community participation, we know there's a free o way. Uh, we support the community's desire for more data and more information. We want it to. The bridge alignment consultation that was referenced that was undertaken in 2021 was positive. We got to an agreed position about the alignment that seems to be broadly supported. So it speaks to the benefits of putting options out there and letting the community have an informed say. Uh, we have achieved some things, as Councillor Mufflin referenced, by being part of the conversation in a constructive way. We will win some things, we won't win everything. I'm supportive of this amendment. I applaud Councillor Archibald and thank her for consulting with a number of us um, so that it well articulates what we believe the community and we need to know to make a more informed decision. Um, by publishing what we know, the three options that were presented to us as elected members by the Bridge Alliance, we hope we've begin, begun to improve the information that's on the table, but we all look forward to having more on which to base our uh, decision making. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? I just wanted to raise one small change because um, because of some discussion that I had with my colleagues um, this afternoon, and this is where I actually started, where I didn't want to make decisions about options. I just wanted to have a, um, a community discussion and, a, and an elected member discussion about that. So part three, I started with just options, and then I went to one and three, but I would prefer now to just go back to the impacts of options 
and in particular. So it just takes out any decisions. We don't make any decision then about options. That's that's something that could come out of a discussion that we can have in the future. So if everybody's comfortable with that very minor amendment. I would have, is that, that would be in, are you moving that moving as an that amendment, as an amendment to the yeah. amendment so they can be yes. debated? Yes, it would, I'll second, if the seconder to the amendment accepts it, yes, thank you. I just, I mean, we can deal with it at the um, next next council meeting, but I just, that was, I prefer to just leave it open and we will have that discussion over the next two weeks. Um, so with that minor change, um, I guess I also um, just want to acknowledge that um, while people have acknowledged my role in putting this together, um, actually I had the input particularly of council room and uh, we also had lots of discussions with members of the community and I had plenty of discussions with my, my colleagues and the mayor. So um, it is certainly a collective effort and as you have heard tonight, it, it'll be improved even further over the next two weeks. So, um, I, but I think it's such an important project um, to Fremantle. We don't very often get a project of this scale, apart from High Street, <laughs> but this is even bigger, I suspect. So it, it is important for us to have that conversation about the impacts of the various options, how we can get the best outcome for this community. Because, you know, Fremantle is a very special place and um, we want it to stay that way into the future. So it's worth it. I, I'm very hopeful that the other government will come on board and we'll have that discussion and, um, and hopefully come up with a, a, a better solution. So just in with those words, um, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous, thank you. Um, you're very welcome to stay for the rest of the agenda, but otherwise, thank you for coming and thank you for being so careful with your three minute time frame. It was very much appreciated. We have we have some more questions on item one. Um, there's two speakers. Um, where did I put that? Yes. Okay, um, we'll move on to item four for public question. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, no, one, item one for public question time. We've got um, Lisa Barnes wishes to speak on this. Lisa, would you like to come forward and speak on that? Yes, you can, certainly. Again, um, I'm co-convener of the South Fremantle Police Group, Lisa Barnes. So, um, talking about the toilets, so many people love the amenity of the South Beach Park. The new lighting at South Beach is a good thing for night workers, beach users, and for hopefully discouraging antisocial behaviour. We have talked to our people in our precinct. The South Fremantle community were excited about the toilets being built. They were naturally disappointed when 380,000 of our toilet budget was taken from Fremantle's pool roof. We now have been told the project will start during winter 2023. The general consensus is that the temporary toilets may not be totally fit for purpose once the weather warms up and people flock back to the beach. Um, the people's main concerns are the toilets and changing rooms are in one space, meaning the floor where you change is in the toilet space and will always be wet. There's also concerns about hygiene that the toilet should be separate to showers. Um, and will the toilets be cleaned often enough? There is little space to get changed and they get hot and a bit claustrophobic. Um, it sounds like this design is still being deliberated over. I was in the South Beach Place Planning Community Workshops, which included the layout of the toilets. 
the floor plan was um, kind of decided and agreed on um, by a big collection of the community in those meetings. Um, so we're wondering why the design is kind of still being deliberated on. Um, we also would like to know how much the temporary toilet costs and they will probably also have to be moved when the new toilet's been built. The swimming groups really seek mass showering and changing areas to socialise. A couple of years is a long time to be without the old toilet blocks. South Fremantle really want the use of the old toilet blocks until the new ones are built. The main question here is, please can we use the old toilets until the new building works commencing? Thank you. <coughs> I can see if any of the staff members want to comment on about the answer to the question. Thank you, Ruth Chair. Um, one of the reasons for the temporary toilet blocks is, is the poor condition and functionality of the old toilets and the condition of the roof with the con issues with the concrete tanks and so um, hence we're putting the new temporary facilities um, a little bit earlier than we would have done normally otherwise we would have continued to use the old facilities and use large construction. Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head the value or the cost of the um, temporary facilities. We've budgeted for that, provision for that for this financial year. Um, we do anticipate once we land the location and final design of the new toilet facilities that we'll have to move the temporary facilities to facilitate that. Um, but I very much doubt that we'd be in a position to reopen or reuse um, the old facilities because essentially I anticipate we're going to build in the same location as, as the old facilities. Thank you. Um, Lisa? I just want to reiterate um, what Gina has said and also reinforce that um, the people in South Fremantle really don't like the temporary toilets and would like to use the old ones. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> um, but also um, one thing that has been, it's been raised um, quite a lot is um, just around getting some amenities at Little Dog Beach near the Yacht Club and is there an opportunity to get something there put on the capital program um, even if it's not you know, something that's maybe self-contained and not plumbed into sewers to understand that that's going to be one of those places that's going to be impacted. That has been considered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, we have one more speaker, and that is Mark Hitchcock, who wishes to speak on guest poll item four. Is that correct? Well, perhaps just come forward and speak on both at the same time. Okay, so the good evening, everyone. Um, Mark again. Um, I just wanted to raise an issue that was brought to council, I mean, literally decades ago, and that is the Matilda Bay Brewing Site, formerly the, no, it was the form, former brewing site and was also the former Ford Assembly uh, location. I found it astonishing that the site hasn't received a higher ranking by the State's Heritage Council after a first after a 1A rating on Council's Municipal Registry. I would request that the City of Fremantle Council make a motion to make an urgent request to the State Heritage Body to make an immediate assessment to list the site appearing on their website as the Matilda Bay Brewing Building former. On my page that I sent you, I put the link to the website. Uh, this place has been identified by the Heritage Council of Western Australia as worthy of consideration for the entry into the registry, State Registry of Heritage Places since March 2004. The place was included in the North Tremantle Heritage Study in 1994 as a place contributing to the development and the heritage of North Tremantle. It was also included in the list of heritage places in the city of Fremantle identified by the Fremantle Society in 1979-80, giving a red status significantly contributing to the unique character of Fremantle. The site has decades of recognition for its heritage significance 
for the city of Fremantle and especially North Fremantle. It's amazing that the site has been forgotten and ignored and hasn't been given its proper place in history for the protection of its heritage. It's a well-known icon leaving and entering Fremantle by road. It sits, it sits well as a North Fremantle icon along, the, along with the Dingo Flour Mill, which is a standout height feature in North Fremantle. The height scale and bulk and scale of proposed developments trivialise the site, Matilda Bay Brewing Company, heritage buildings, as well as the nearby Dingo Flour Mill. The scale of Dingo has always been the marker of North Fremantle, the sign you see at sea that Fremantle is nearby. It's also a clear marker for North Fremantle beaches looking east and would be trivialised by an out-of-scale development on the Matilda Bay Brewing site. So that really I'm just asking for council to consider the heritage of the area. We saw in the thing that heritage is important in Fremantle, but this hasn't been added to the list, and I think it's a worthy thing to be added to the heritage list. Council was working on it, for whatever reason it dropped off the, the system, but there's nowhere it says that it doesn't deserve that place in, its, in the heritage council's listing. Uh, the other one was the Quarry Street, which is a F-pole item. I'm quite amazed that the council is considering selling another property under value. I mean, you've got a long list of properties that have been sold through Fremantle to fund this particular building. I imagine that one is going to be sold off to pad some of the over expenses. We've seen that with the Henderson Street car park that was sold for half of its replacement cost. We built a car park, which the state government's going to take off you and put a building on, so we've lost more parking, not to mention the money that was spent to do that. The reported million dollar loss on the Spicer site, the sale of Point Street, which was had good plans back in 2007, 2008, which council saw fit to stop. And we've seen that site derelict for years now, including a parking space that's completely underutilised. The Queensgate building also sold well under its uh, value sale. And there are questions also tonight on Quarry Street. Why are we selling it so cheaply? You know, if it's a bad market, no builder's going to come and build on it tomorrow. They can't get people, they can't get materials. You'll sell it, they'll land bank it, they'll flog it on for a profit. So the ratepayers are funding another builder or another developer or land banker. So I would really urge you not to sell the Quarry Street and keep what assets we have left and make sure if we do sell them, we sell them for good value, not under value as we've seen within the last decade of council's history of land sales. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so that's the end of question time, as I have listed on my list. So um, we will now go back to the committee. And um, <coughs> so we, I, well, I'll move um, F poll 2010 number one, South Beach facility. So a seconder, seconded by Councillor Mofflin. Is there any discussion? Councillor Sullivan. Uh, thank you. I was probably going to steal Councillor Groom's uh, thunder, so I apologise for that. Um, just questions, I guess. The um, When we uh, had a look at this um, through a workshop and, and uh, when it came here last time, one of the very clear things we asked for was um, that the public amenity of swimmers getting changed, having their shower um, in the mornings um, needed to be uh, improved from the initial designs. So that, that the spaces um, that what the space that was available and the seating and hooks and the like, um, the wall space that was available for that was um, arguably inadequate by a fair bit. Um, we then saw alternative designs which significantly increased that space. Um, and my understanding was that, that there was a lot of support for that uh, approach. Um, and it's come back with the space for the shower block elements almost exactly the same as it was before we raised it as an issue. So. The only change is that the actual shower cubicles have increased in number. So they've, there are four shower spots, 
now three of them are cubicles and one's not and the cubicle size has been made bigger um, and accommodates an actual uh, seated changing space in the cubicle uh, and has been rightly pointed out uh, what that does uh, yes it might increase the number of spaces that where you can get changed but getting changed in the shower um, cubicle means that at peak time that shower is not available for quite a long period of time as opposed to the 30 seconds or or a minute or maybe even two minutes that someone might stand actually in the shower and then get back out again. So it's actually going to create a log jam um, if people start changing in those cubicles. Um, and having more cubicles, there is part of a, a, a joy in the community uh, that, yeah, having a couple of cubicles is a good idea, but having communal showers is exactly that, communal, um, and that everybody just gets along with everybody else and it speeds the process up. So I'm just curious i want to ask i want to prosecute how did we get to the point where we raised that as a really big issue and yet we've come back to the design option that basically does not fix that problem at all i don't have the answer so okay um the manager of um, all the things that Chris is involved with. Thank you, through the chair. Um, so I suppose the the original concept plan had uh, four changing places inside the actual facilities. Um, we did the, the two options, um, I think option one and option two that came back, um, had increased changing facilities. One, I believe, had um, six off the top of my head, and then the largest version had uh, 10 internal. Um, <clears throat> I suppose the impact of the 10 internals was elongated the building, and that brought the tree um, removal into play. So the option that's come back uh, sought to retain the tree or increase the internal change areas to six. Um, but then seek to provide some additional and further changing facilities actually back within the shower cubicles um, as well. Yeah. Um, did you have any further comments, Councillor Groom? Yep. Uh, thank you. So I have a number of concerns. Exactly that, that um, it's been pretty consistent feedback and there is a, you know, a regular swimming community at South Beach, in addition to the number of families, etc., using it during the day that use these spaces. Um, the, the original design we saw was inadequate. We are being told now that there are six spaces, but the reality is, and we have raised this with the designers, is that when people are getting changed with strangers, they need more personal space than has been put forward on these designs. So six people have been drawn on the plan that's not how those spaces will be used. Um, so, you know, I'm, we just want to approve this thing and get it built. Like, it's really frustrating that we keep having to ask these questions and stop it and that somehow the brief is getting lost. And I know the architects are strongly wedded to the scheme they've got and so, you know, we won't get in the way of that. But I think that council will now be faced with a decision about the tree because can't build something that simply doesn't and spend three million dollars on a few toilets that simply don't do the job we need them to do. So I'm not sure where the committee stands on that or whether we need to defer it to council and sort that out, but I am really concerned that to sign off on this tonight is not meeting the fundamental brief. Um, or maybe it can be signed off in a way that caveats that. And, you know, I don't want to be the one saying that that tree should go, but I'm not, I just think what we've got, we're going to get screamed at if that gets built. So. Councillor Lane. Thanks. Um, just following on from a question that um, Lisa actually uh, rounded out her, her three-minute speech with was, um, was a note about having the toilets down towards Dog Beach more. I, I've brought this up in a few of our meetings as well. Um, right now, as Councillor Groom has mentioned, we've now got 
um, footprint constraints for the building. We've got a tree on one end and a cafe on the other, and we're trying to sandwich this new building in. And what I've been asking through the process is, is it possible to have the bathroom, or the new facility, located in the middle of the two beaches we've got at South Beach because the dog beach is being totally forgotten in this whole conversation. I'm aware that the consultation did occur, but the consultation occurred out the front of the existing bathroom. And the other beach where, where I frequent more, people I've spoken to weren't even aware we did consultation. And like Lisa saying to me, where's the bathroom for the other beach? Why, why aren't we considering building this um, in the middle of the two beaches? And I, I know sewage has been mentioned, and I've asked in an email a number of times, is there a sewage connection on Marine Terrace that's been looked into? What is the exact complication with sewage? Or what is the cost to move? Like, what is the cost for the sewage upgrade? And that, that answer's never come through. And if I, I'm about to be voting on this soon, I want to make sure I'm voting on something in the right location that's possibly serving in the two beaches. And if we've got more space to build something, we can design a building around it better. So is there um, an answer for Lisa's question about the other beach and sewage? Um, we did discuss that at some point in the committee, but um, I'll, would you like to make a comment or perhaps over to Manager Park? Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Um, I'd have to take the question on the sewage on notice. Um, the Labor Guide have done some research on it down at the Dog Beach and are applying for three there. Uh, to the first point, the consultation we did on the, both the place plan and the community, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the change facility did, it came across very strongly that um, a new facility in the northern portion of the Dog Beach service and that would be uh, desired by the community. Um, that is picked up in the consultation that came out of the, the draft place plan report as well, which we've been um, here for. And then that would possibly be put on the, the senior plan for the coming year. Councillor Mosley. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was most probably inclined to be able to move on this tonight and uh, progress these facilities. It's been something that is around for a long time and I'm really reluctant for us to, to move it. But there are opinions of two elected members who most probably understand space a little better than what I do. Um, who I value, I, I value their opinion, um, and without committing to it at this point in time, is a, as a question, is there an opportunity for additional work to be done between now and council uh, to consider some of, or to look at what has been spoken about tonight to progress? Because I would be really reluctant for us to put it down the road for another six, eight weeks and um, find ourselves in a position where we're not getting any work done. So, that, yeah, I suppose that's a question about is there any ability to do work between now and then? Um, one of the staff members, Dr. Clark. Just through the chair, there's, there's been a, a number of design options um, moved beyond the, the two or three that we're, we're looking at now. Um, I think ultimately it is getting down to that decision of s squeezing a facility in and retaining the tree or losing the tree and um, and giving you that extra space. And, um, there are a lot of, of um, associated issues with levels and access paths that really restrict what you can and can't do in and around um, the area going east to west. Uh, and there's the consideration of beach options for a cafe, septic, all sorts of different issues. So the, I, 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 w I would, I'm pretty confident that the architects have pulled this to bits and pulled, turned it around as much as they possibly can. Um, there's a compromise with, with the solutions. I think what we're presenting here is the best of the two compromise solutions. We either compromise on the amount of change facility and how that functions, or we go for the um, expanded design and remove the tree. Councillor Thompson. Um, sorry, this is a councillor's decision? A committee decision. Okay, then I, I'm not. Look, um, given the issues that have been raised tonight, I mean, I'd be very reluctant to approve this, and so therefore I think we should probably 
realistically give it one more go and defer it to council and uh, and uh, allow those issues that have been raised tonight to to be addressed because everything's a compromise so it just depends on how far we want to go so um, I would seek to move a deferral to council uh, for, for to answer specifically to answer the questions raised tonight yeah well, we can certainly uh, move that it goes before council um, Councillor Bucci I was actually going to do exactly the same thing I don't think we're ready to make a decision this evening um, and I think we need to be 110 percent sure given the money that we're going to be spending. So I would support a deferral. Um, Mayor Fitzharding is already on the... Um, is the referral, is it a referral or a deferral? Like, is it a, after the fact, two people send it to council or...? Well, the, I was intending to, oh, and what I just suggested just before you spoke, was that we um, we can make a decision and then ask for that decision to be sent to full council so that in the two weeks in between, discussions can be had about the benefits and disbenefits and then if we are still concerned, it can be um, deferred further work. So that w that is one alternate. Is, is everybody kind of on board with that? The problem is, if it gets defeated, then that's it. And I would certainly be voting against it. Yeah. Well, at the moment, I have Mayor Fitz Harding wishing to speak. Perhaps we can just defer just the item, the it's idea of what we do with it until everybody's spoken, and then we'll work out what we do, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so just a couple of things. I mean, I, I do find it really hard when we keep visiting things and visiting things and visiting things and not making a decision, and particularly if it's start to push into new budget years and all that kind of stuff, and we spend more money on architects and don't actually build anything. So let me just express some slight frustration around that. Um, I hear from elected members that it's really valuable to have a whole lot of sitting around getting change space inferior to a change room. Um, this is publicly available to people right now and zero people have told up, turned up to tell us that that's really important. So if it is that important, please come and explain it to me why it's so important prior to the next council, you know, during the next council meeting. Um, I think what my, one of my concerns would be if we say, we want to reduce the number of uh, closed cubicle um, change rooms or re stop people from changing in a fixed cubicle. We make it less family friendly. There are certain ages of kids and teenage girls and people with diverse bodies and things who just don't want to get changed in public. Um, so we, we've got to look at maybe the existing community but also the large community that's attracted to use South Beach. Um, so I just think we've got to be... I, we've got to be careful how much we want to design this ourselves. Um, we did what we said other people should do, which is go through a community engagement process to inform this design. And I'm a little bit conscious that we're saying you should do that, and then we're doing that, and then saying, but we'll design it ourselves. And I think we would be highly critical, as we have been tonight, highly critical of other organisations that do that. So. I'm just feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but I can cope with it going up to full council. I don't think we should rescope it as another project, which is, was what would we be doing if we were moving it to a location on the beach. Um, but if we don't make a decision on this soon, like the community is going to look at us and just think, what are you doing? Councillor Lane? Oh, I'm sorry, that was me. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, thank you. Yeah, it, there does appear to be some questions on this final design that haven't, haven't really been answered. But we've also taken about 35% of the budget that we allocated back in July, and we're putting it in the Leisure Center route, so we're already dealing with a, a reduced amount to deliver in this financial year anyways. So maybe it is worth it if we're spending $3 million overall to make sure that we're doing it right, and we're doing it right the first time, and it, and it ticks all the boxes that we can tick, that we could reasonably tick. So yeah, if there is a way to spend a little more time on it, I think it'll be good. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, just in terms of what the difference is, um, 
we're not talking about going back and redesigning. The design for the bigger change room spaces was already presented to us. Uh, it's in option one. Uh, it's basically saying uh, we want to support the option that the, well, I know what I would want, support the option that the officers have put in front of us, but with the change rooms uh, increased in length to accommodate the design that was presented in option one, uh, which is uh, benches that run uh, along two walls rather than one wall, significantly increasing the amount of uh, change space and wall space for um, members of the public. It had the original proposal was for two cubicles um, and two uh, non-cubicle showers. That's always what came through, um, and no one was complaining about that. It was only when we talked about increasing the number of or space for changing that the architects went to three cubicles because they could then add change spaces in the cubicles to try and accommodate our request. And what we're saying is that the feedback that I know I've received is that that's actually going to make it worse, not better. Um, I would just also say, to be fair, um, when this went out for community consultation and when the um, community uh, came back, that was the response that they gave uh, to us. Uh, and they certainly gave it to me through the precinct and through um, you know, my role as a South Ward councillor, uh, was very clear. It wasn't me saying that. It was the community saying um, the space in there looks really, really small. We currently enjoy a really generous space. Um, we don't want to lose that in the new design. If we, um, you know, it's such an important social part of our experience um, as, as a casual group of swimmers down there. Um, and that experience is also true at the Leisure Centre. It's also true over at Leighton. So it's not, it shouldn't have come as any surprise to us, but it was the community who said, can you make sure if you're going to build a three and a half million dollar new facility that we don't feel like we've got less space uh, overall uh, in terms of that community facility? The big question for this council, and you know, I get that we've had a couple of goes at it through workshops and, and the like. The big question has has been that we, the council, have to make the decision as to whether we want the longer change room spaces um, and accept that the tree needs to go or that the tree is more important than the social function of the change rooms um, and that we're um, going to keep the tree. Now, every elected member needs to go down there and decide that. What we did last time was to say the tree is important, the change room spaces are important um, and the officers effectively made the decision for us to say, Right, well, we're going to keep the tree, which is a very lovely tree. It's probably one of the better Norfolk's, um, healthier Norfolk's that's, that's down there. But there are a lot of them, and I'm more than happy to go and plant a, a, a heap more because we're going to need them anyway uh, because those trees are getting to the sort of, you know, 100-year length of their lifespan. So for me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. You need to get the function right, um, and um, I'll happily get yelled at for having chopped a single tree down, uh, knowing how many thousands uh, that I've personally planted um, in my own time. But that's that's what we need to do, and we need to do that between now and full council. So the staff probably just need to come back and say, well, the other option is the longer change room with the trees chopped down, it'll cost this much. Um, just make that amendment, bring it to council, make a decision. You'll either choose one or the other, depending on your priorities and the community will get on with it. Um, is there any further discussion before I make a few comments in closing? Okay, um, well, I'm, I was, I'm quite happy to support this um, recommendation and, and ask for it to go on to full council so that it can be um, further assessed in the interim and then we can always come up with an alternate motion between now and then, if there is an alternate motion. Um, yes? Just through the Chair, I've just confirmed with the officer, we do have an alternative option that provides for the removal of the tree in bigger rooms. We can add it to this item if it's pushed forward to Council and give Council the option of picking either or. Um, so just to finish, um, 
uh, well, I do support what's before us for the moment and have it go to full council, knowing that we can do more work in the next two weeks. Um, I'll just add, though, that I am very reluctant to chop that tree down. It's the one big statement that you have when you drive to South Beach, down that little road, there it is, the most magnificent, healthy Norfolk pine that we have down there. So, um, and we do have a lack of facilities at the other end of the beach, and I just wonder if we one day do get to put more facilities up there, whether the um, it would all work out okay. But I'm not an architect, and I do defer to my colleagues who've made the comments they have. So I'd be very supportive of this going on to full council. So the motion is before us. If we support this, um, I will move that it goes to full council. So all those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. I'll move that it goes to full council. Is that seconded? All those in favour? Council seconded. All those in favour? Everyone supported. It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Um, so, th thank you for attending. It's been wonderful to have four extra elected members here tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do Quarry Street. Um, we'll we'll um, move on to um, F poll 2210-4, which is the sale of Quarry Street. And in, I'll move that, but in moving it, I'll um, note that it is a council decision, not a committee decision. So it will be going on to full council. So is there a seconder to that motion? Councillor Pemberton? No. Councillor Mofflin? Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councillor Pemberton? Um, yeah, look, I wanted to just pick up one thing that troubled me while I was reading this, and I'd really like to see it corrected for the um, report that goes to council. There is a um, interchange between using 5 to 15 quarry and 7 to 15 quarry. It's repeatedly referred to as both or either or and so on, and I think with a decision like this, it's pretty important that we're really clear about what property we're actually talking about, whether or not it's two sites or one and, and so on. So... Um, I'd love to see that kind of um, clarified throughout and used consistently. And then um, more generally, I just also wanted to share, and I know I've had conversations with numerous people about this, which is um, I am concerned that we are potentially um, not reaping the same kind of level of revenue from this that we were originally anticipating, and yet we're also compromising you know, the social or community benefits or gains that are from it. And while I recognise that... Um, you know, development in this site will have good impact no matter what it is. I just worry that we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater potentially and um, I would like us to see whether or not this is really the best solution at this stage or whether or not we're better off holding on to this property and activating it in a different way temporarily and um, looking for other revenue opportunities that might not be... Um, you know, taking a loss in terms of book value. Yeah. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Okay, Councillor Sullivan. Um, I'll just flag, um, without getting into the confidential part of it, the attachment, but I will flag, um, many of you know that I have pushed um, for a PAW or, or an access way uh, through that site. Um, I'm pretty well convinced now that um, the only way to really get that resolved um, is to exclude a section of the site from the sale. Um, and so I'll flag that I'll um, seek that amendment um, at full council and request the officers uh, to uh, perhaps write some wording uh, along, that, along those lines. Um, it's effectively the option uh, three um, in the confidential documents, I think. Um, I'm not sure if they're actually classed as options, but um, it's the config, the third version, option C, is the version effectively that I would be uh, seeking to move, and so I'm just flagging that, um, flagging that now. Uh, just to ask a question on that, if I could. Um, because the blocks have to be amalgamated, um, if the council makes a decision, the process of amalgamation and resubdivision is effectively the same. So 
if between now and full council, you can just confirm that, uh, that it won't actually delay the process because you have to actually, we, the recommendation recommends that we amalgamate the blocks. So there's not a lot of difference between doing an amalgamation and subdivision or just a straight amalgamation in terms of time frame. You basically lodge all the documents, you're creating uh, one lot out of three lots or you're creating two lots out of three lots. Thank you. Um, Kelsey, Hans, can I just use this? Yeah, sorry, just one other point. And um, I did raise this in discussion earlier, which was um, about point F, so 4F, that refers to the opportunity for the city to repurchase the property. Um, I have concerns about including that, given that we've never acted on that ever, and we're probably not likely to. And, you know, the only way I would kind of support it is if it actually explicitly said for the same price as we got for it, like in terms of rather than market value or some other agreed unknown thing. Um, so I would prefer to either, I mean, and it doesn't need to be done now because I didn't flag it, but um, for full council, whether or not that gets removed entirely or whether or not we actually stipulate we, we purchase it back for the, we, the original purchase price. We'll, we'll note that. Um, okay, is there any further discussion? All those in favour of the motion? All those against? Oh, sorry. Those against is Councillor Kamada and Councillor Richards. The motion is carried. <coughs> um, I think that was the last item you were keen to. You're welcome to stay. Yeah, yeah good, good. No, 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 but just. Okay, um, we'll go back to the agenda. Um, item two. Um, so I just wanted to, I realised. Um, because I sought advice quickly that I have a conflict of interest because I have received a gift over the value of that amount, whatever it is, $300 from one of the shortlisted um, tenderers in this being um, Good Drinks, Dave Strode. Um, therefore, I cannot stay for this item. I have a conflict. Um, Okay, so the Mayor has declared um, an interest in this. <coughs> I will, yeah. Um, so I'll move the item, seconded by Councillor Moughlin. Is there any discussion on the item? Councillor Moughlin. Yeah, just very quickly, I had a question in regards to the sponsorship element of the, um, of the deal and if we could get a comment as to what that actually looked like. Uh, through the chair, so the sponsorship arrangement is actually a waiver of fees rather than the provision of any sort of cash, um, and we would be seeking recognition to the value of that waiver um, by way of all of the benefits we've listed in the item. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councillor Pemberton. I just had a really short point, which um, was, I, I think this is a really good step, particularly in light of the issue around cans versus bottles. So I noticed that the tender is actually for cans. And, um, you know, this is something I wanted us to adopt in our um, event, sustainable event policy, which is um, aluminium is much more easily recyclable um, and is recycled here in Western Australia as opposed to glass, which is crushed up and re used as road base. Um, so I think a transition towards using cans rather than plastic or glass is good. Um, manager, I know the director of uh, City Business. Uh, I'll just clarify on that sponsorship question. I spoke on the incorrect item. Um, uh, through the uh, through the chair, the sponsorship agreement is um, represents a um, arrangement whereby we put the benefit back into the events and the programs that are run specifically with um, South Beach. Oh, sorry. sorry, my apologies. I've been listening to South Beach, um, the South Lawn events. Yes, 
So I, I think similarly then the response might have been quite similar that it's an in-kind, sorry, yeah, just to clarify. Yeah, is it cash coming from, some, It's this one's cash? Yes, it's a, a cash sponsorship, it's, it's a, sorry, through the chair, um, it's a cash sponsorship arrangement that is industry practice um, and is a practice that's legislated through the Local Government Act as well, so, but yes, it is cash. Right, thank you. Is there any further discussion? All those in favour? Okay, those against? Councillor Bucic, which way were you in favour? Okay, so then a motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. <coughs> okay, we'll move on to um, the council decision section. Is it parklet policy? Sorry, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, I'll move F poll. 22103, seconded by Councillor Kamada. Is there any discussion on this item? All so those in the sorry? proposed amendment to it. Oh, just to um, thank you for reminding me. Back in front. Um, so it's in your additional documents, and I think it just captures the uh, discussion that we had in a briefing session on this, which was that we didn't need to sort of include High Street Mall as being excluded from this, um, although it doesn't technically meet the definition of a parklet should something be done in High Street Mall. We probably wouldn't want to discourage people from doing anything that activates High Street Mall, so it makes sense to take it out. Um, so I'm moving that as an amendment. If anyone agrees with it, that would be good. I'm happy to second the amendment. If all those in favour of the amendment. Is there any further discussion on the parklet policy? It is going out to public for public comment. Yeah. Okay. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Right. We've done four. Um, item five, we do have a conflict of interest from Councillor Kamada. So we will... I will move that item. Is there a seconder? Seconded by the Mayor. Um, is there any discussion? All those in favour? Those against? No? Councillor Bucic, you were in favour. So at the end of three years, we're going to... Sorry, at the end of Karen. three years, we're going to finish this thousand dollars a year and we'll continue. Uh, that's the value of the fees that we would waive over the term of the entire sponsorship agreement. What are we going to get in, 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 in return for that? Uh, there is a series of benefits that we've listed in the item, which is standard and linked to our grants and sponsorship policy. Um, we will be recognised as the presenting partner of the event um, and one of the major sponsors. I just think it's a hell of a lot of money, um, 236000 um, When I have a look at the community event, uh, the South Fremantle Festival of Lights, which was, um, you know, I think that's, if my memory says me correctly, $7,000 from the city. It brought 20,000 people in. And I look at the value. Um, what else are we going to get out of it? I mean, I've, I've read the, the document. It's a lot of money. Uh, through the chair. So the intent is that by supporting this event over the first three years, we're helping it establish itself to grow beyond those three years and become a, a, an annual event in Fremantle. Um, the event organiser actually hopes to build it into an international event with... Um, yeah, the hope that it grows those attendance numbers over those um, hopefully three to ten years. 
there is an intent to approach Tourism Western Australia after three years as well for further funding to help grow into international markets. So um, the support we're providing up front is effectively um, seed support to help it go to that next stage. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Mothman. Yeah, I'll just add the only potential cash contribution in any sense is $17,500 per turf replacement in the first year and the rest is fee waivers. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a reasonable investment and it is something that we approved previously and it's sliding um, a, a, a year or so due to those um, events that have been beyond our control. So I think it's a really important event for us to support. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Can you keep moving? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Think so? Yeah. Sorry, we've got to be quick now. <laughs> Finish at nine. We're a little bit late. Um, we'll now um, do item six, the cat management local law undertakings. I'll move that, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Councillor Lang. Sure, I will speak to this. Um, pretty incredible, incredibly frustrating point we've landed at at the moment um, on this journey. Um, when we put this last submission through, um, the advice we were dealing with with Charlie at the time, um, sort of expanding from our parks to other areas, we went for all city owned and managed land. And we raised that during the debate then that that was the first approach we were going to try. And if that failed, then we would come back and list explicitly all the lots that would be on the prohibited list. And that's the feedback coming from the Joint Standing Committee as well. Is there confusion for a cat owner if they don't know exactly where they are prohibited from? Um, we've had some positive meetings with the Minister of Environment's office um, recently. And as recently as last week, speaking with the Minister of Local Government office as well, about what we can do together to try and so we we can stop shooting in the dark, and every other local government in the state can stop shooting in the dark because because we're not alone uh, in this fight at the moment. It's actually becoming more and more mainstream. Everyone's probably aware of that. So I do hold some uh, optimism that we can land on um, a local law for in in the government in, in our government that the joint standing committee will settle on. Um, if they don't and we can't, then I think we've proven that the CAT Act is a policy dead end and there needs to be an amendment made. Um, so I'm, I'm keen to have that meeting with the Minister of Environment and Local Governments Office again um, to refine what will work for them um, because they are, they are saying to me, we don't like feral cats and uh, we just need to draw that connection between domestic cats and feral cats because it's the same species. Um, so I do uh, hold some optimism we can find something. And as I say, otherwise there will have to be an amendment made to the CAT Act. Um, it is still an important issue. Um, cats are still killing 3 billion native animals a year. And it absolutely is a local government issue. And I think we've got a, a strong role to play um, in urban areas and eliminating feral cats from um, our bushland areas and outback Australia. So very frustrating. Um, and we'll see what we can revise. Thanks, um, Melody's not here, but thanks, Melody, for working on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention too that this does go on to full council, so if there's anything that's different in the next two weeks, we'll be able to address it there. Yep. Is there any further discussion? All those in favour of the motion for us? Those against? Councillor Lucci. Thank you. Um, we now move... Oh, I think we might have actually come to the end of the agenda. Um, there are no motions, of which previous notion, motions or notions have been given. Uh, I'll just urge it. There is no urgent business, there are no late items, no confidential business. I therefore declare this meeting closed. Thank you.